Dude, this is going to especially kill you as someone that travels even for like two and three day trips just with a backpack. Oh, it's so going to kill me. Like you're never traveling that way again. I know. You're checking like car checking seats the, and yes, backpacks yep, and yep. I'll see you at baggage claim, my friend. Oh my God. <laughs> Who got the truth? Is it you? Is it you? Is it you? Who got the truth now? Is it you? Is it you? Is it you? Sit me down, say it straight. Another story on the way. Who got the truth? Welcome to season nine, episode five of Acquired, the podcast about great technology companies and the stories and playbooks behind them. I'm Ben Gilbert, and I'm the co founder and managing director of Seattle based Pioneer Square Labs and our venture fund, PSL Ventures. And I'm David Rosenthal, and I'm an angel investor based in San Francisco. And we are your hosts. When we last left our hero, villain? Unclear. We saw John D. Rockefeller (laughs) supporting the Sherman Antitrust Act as a piece of dead-on-the-vine legislation with really nothing to fear from it. Today, we will cover Standard Oil from 1890 through their, spoiler alert, breakup in 1911. Ben, you're ruining the punchline. (laughs) Uh, We're going to cover Rockefeller's legacy and philanthropy and how today's world is a Rockefeller-shaped one in more ways than one. We will also debate the finer points of where Standard Oil crossed the line between using legitimate business practices like operational efficiency and economies of scale into straight-up abuses of power to grow their massive, massive profits. You mean like bribing elected officials? (laughs) David, I... Look, I don't want to spoil anything here, I guess, other (laughs) other than the breakup. (laughs) Well, uh, there's also, we should say, there is a ludicrous amount of post-1911 oil industry history that we will uh, find some way to dive into in the future uh, on a dedicated sort of energy industry history special. uh, Because there's, you know, especially once you leave the U.S. and get into the the uh, the powers that be internationally. I think it's a, a, a we could do six more episodes. Oh, uh, totally. Well, we'll have to in the future. We will. Well, uh, listeners, we want to say thank you, David. What for? Yeah, we have had a uh, pretty crazy month here <laughs> at Acquired. Uh, the uh, starting with the TSMC episode, we have just been on. I don't know what it is. Y'all like semiconductors, but uh, <laughs> uh, the show has been growing hugely. Uh, so much good stuff is going on um and uh we, we we were talking beforehand like we really do want to keep our try and keep our intro shorter and just start getting right into the stories but uh two things today one is this we got to say thank you to all of you like this journey is incredible and in particular thank you to our old listeners for like spreading the gospel like we've really enjoyed this like slow methodical linear growth because it's i think it's helped us hone the product of of acquired um but of course like an explosive growth spurt is always a fun thing so so thank you to those of you for spreading the word over the years and welcome to all the new folks yeah indeed and then uh two unrelated to the episode but uh special little fun thing to talk about um we are about to have a new addition to the acquired family maybe uh a spinoff is that what it is a spinoff yeah, not uh, an on-air edition, though. No, not, not an acquisition, a, a, a spinoff. No, not on-air. Um, this is so crazy. By the time y'all hear this, Jenny and I will have had a, uh, uh, presumably will have had a, uh, a little baby girl that we are expecting any day now. Honestly, it was like coming down to the wire of recording this. It was <laughs> very nerve-wracking. But This um, was almost a serious cliffhanger where we just did part one and then David disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, friend, a bunch of my friends were asking me like, hey, like, so excited for you and the you know the baby and all that but um you're gonna get recording for part two and before the baby comes (laughs) well david uh uh, congratulations so excited for you and jenny i think uh we will be really fun to you know hear dad stories on future shows and on twitter maybe maybe hear some crying baby in in future episode backgrounds um yeah we uh we can't wait i'm sure well last thing before we dive into Part two here of the Standard Oil story is, as always, Pilot, our presenting sponsor for all of season nine. Pilot is the backbone of the modern financial stack for startups. As you know, they are backed by all-star investors themselves like Sequoia, Index, Bezos Expeditions, and Stripe. They are truly, 
truly, truly the gold standard for startup bookkeeping. If John D. Rockefeller were starting Standard Oil today, he would not do the books himself. He would have Pilot do it. Stop doing uh, your books. <laughs> it's, it's obvious. Outsource it. You're not a books company. Uh, yeah, you're not a... <laughs> You're not a books company. That's great. <laughs> you're not. You're not an accounting company. Like any of you listening out there, like 0.1% of you run an accounting company. So get Pilot to do it instead. <laughs> uh, so good. All right. Now over to our conversation with co-founders Wasim Daher and Jessica McKellar. So we talked last time about what changed that enabled you all to build Pilot as an actual technology company versus just a professional services provider as pretty much every startup bookkeeping service was before y'all. What services does Pilot integrate with and what does that look like from your customer's point of view? Yeah, I mean, one of the great things about Pilot is first, it doesn't matter what institutions you're using, we know how to ingest and take good care of your financial stack. Now, on top of that, one of the great things about Pilot is that we do have the expertise for these deep integrations with tools as they evolve quickly. You know, Stripe releases a new invoicing API, we can get on that immediately. So if you are taking advantage of these fintech solutions as they continue to evolve, you're really going to want a partner that's able to keep up with that on the finance side. That being said, really, it's sort of our problem. How do we correctly reflect your business needs in your books? And the good thing about Pilot is, you know, you're talking to a person who understands you and your business and your needs and is taking care of translating that into what happens on the back end, you don't have to worry about how to integrate with these institutions because that's our job. And you can just sit back and let us handle that for you. What a good example of what we've been talking about all season here, which is as a startup founder, bookkeeping is not something you want to deal with. (laughs) That's Pilot's job. And you can be sure with you guys that you're not only going to be on top of all the latest API changes from Stripe or Plaid or whomever, but you're just going to take care of the job. Yep. You can learn more about Pilot and whether they can help your company eliminate the pain of tax prep and bookkeeping by going to pilot.com slash acquired. And thanks to Wasim and Jessica, all acquired listeners, if you use that link, you will get 20% off your first six months of service. Super excited as always to have them with us. Thank you. And seriously, as Ben says, it's a killer deal and stop doing your books. The Gilbert Doctrine. Gilbert Doctor, stop <laughs> doing your books. Have Pilot do them for you. Well, David, uh, this one, we're going to cover some companies that are are newer. So we actually need to say this is not investment advice. This is for entertainment and educational purposes. We may hold some of the companies that we're talking about, but uh, you know, they're, they're pretty old companies and they're super merged together at this point. So the, the incarnation that we'll be talking about of the ESO company today on this show is extremely different than the company that uh, many of you may hold or very intentionally not hold today. All right. So last, we left our plucky uh, (laughs) anti-heroes. I like anti-heroes. I think that's what we're going to go with. Uh, Ben, as you said, the Sherman Antitrust Act had just passed. Everybody's having a good laugh about it. (laughs) The political money is still uh, flowing around uh, like hotcakes uh, or uh, uh, fine wine, uh, which, of course, Rockefeller didn't drink because he he never had a drop of alcohol in his life. And what was the language that everyone that 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 made everyone feel like the, the legislation was DOA? Yes. The key modifier modifying clause in the Sherman Antitrust Act was in restraint of trade. So everything, all combinations were outlawed if they were, quote, in restraint of trade. Which was not defined. Nobody knows what that means. <laughs> uh, it's like Will Ferrell. Like, <laughs> it's provocative. Gets the people going. <laughs> uh, okay, so <laughs> speaking of going, Standard Oil is uh, going. Uh, you know, we said this at the end of part one, like they've won. They've like won capitalism they've won like america 90 percent market share like the whole kerosene market 90 percent belongs to them it's game over um but we did kind of hand wave over a bunch of stuff at the end of last time um one there was the uh you know some trouble brewing back uh in the home front back in the state of ohio so we're gonna cover that uh, and then the big thing that we really just spent like 15 seconds on last time was uh 
the whole, you know, like, oh yeah, JD retires. <laughs> uh, what, what was going on with that? Why do why does he just walk away and ride off into the sunset? It's interesting, like, cause cause he stayed titularly, like his name was still on the door. Oh yeah, and he intended that. Like, I think he actually did want to walk away, right? Oh, he did. Oh, we will get into all of this. But they thought it would be like bad for the shareholders. Mm, maybe, maybe we'll see. All right. So first, let's cover the trouble on the home front uh, back in Ohio. So right around, literally like right as the Sherman Act was passing, um, state legislature members in Ohio, remember, they're like, they're pretty pissed at at Rockefeller and, and at uh, Standard Oil. And like, this goes all the way back to the Cleveland Massacre. And like, you know, he, he has a lot of enemies back home, shall we say. So the state attorney general, a guy named David Watson, he decides that he's going to bring a case uh, against Esso. Um, I don't think it was actually an, an antitrust uh, case, uh, but he argues that the um, uh, it's not. The, the case is that Standard Oil is in violation of the state corporation laws in that they are a Ohio corporation, but they are conducting illegal uh, interstate commerce is is what they allege. Uh, and what they allege, you know, SO had created this this trust structure that was so brilliant but this suit is like, hey, this is just a sham and a front. You're not, act- you didn't like really transfer any assets here, and you're actually breaking our laws. So it takes a couple of years, but by 1892, the case reaches the Ohio Supreme Court, the state Supreme Court, which rules against Standard Oil, which means that the trust has to be dissolved. Like they lost, like this is. The letter of what this means, this Ohio ruling, is like game over, uh, you know. But obviously, that's not what happened. So, so how do they get around this? This seems like a pretty big problem. Well, <laughs> turns out that our uh, our Standard Oil friends have an escape plan that they've already hatched that they have in their back pocket it just for this very occasion. So they had figured out Standard Oil lawyers had figured out that in the state of New Jersey, now they have operations, Standard Oil has operations in New Jersey, but there's no, you know, Rockefeller and crew. They're at 26 Broadway in New York. You know, it started in Ohio. There's no real reason why headquarters, you know, they don't have any special attachment to New Jersey. But (laughs) in New Jersey, there actually is a loophole in state corporate law at the time that did allow New Jersey corporations to straight up hold stock in other out-of-state corporations. No no even need for a trust structure. Like what Ohio is suing them for, New Jersey just allows. That was the reason why they needed the trust structure in the first place is because Standard Oil of Ohio couldn't own any other Standard Oil companies that are operating in any other states and they couldn't have operations in other states. So it was like, it's just this crazy remnant of the fact that we are the united states and yep every single state to date had basically said if you have a charter to operate a corporation in our state that's all the business you can do your total addressable market is our state so <laughs> they've got this loophole in new jersey what what do they do boom they just reorganize the whole thing <laughs> and they transfer all the trust maybe trust you know the ohio assets all the assets um into uh, the new Standard Oil of New Jersey. Or again, at least they make a public show of this. They tell the courts, they tell everybody like, oh, yeah, 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 this is what we're doing. You know, whether they actually do this or not, we'll maybe see a little later in the episode. Uh, doesn't matter though, problem solved. So as a uh, turnout, writes and Titan about this, quote, the 1892 overhaul was mostly shadow play, a charade to appease the courts. The executive committee at 26 Broadway, of course, the, you know, Rockefeller and, and all the Flagler and all the cronies, uh, was formally dissolved, but the members lost only their titles and were soon converted by the nicest legal cunning into the presidents of 20 affiliated companies. In standard parlance, these men were now, quote, the gentlemen upstairs, or alternatively, quote, the gentlemen in room 1400. Nobody had to switch seats at the lunch table 
and Rockefeller and his coterie ruled as absolutely as before. (laughs) Fascinating. And so you've got this Standard Oil of New Jersey that, by the letter of the law, owns wholly or near wholly all these other, you know, at this point, 20 some companies that are operating in all these other states. And so the way that that sort of structurally looked is all the people who were the trustees of the Standard Oil Trust are now the presidents of all those companies. And they're working remotely from Manhattan. <laughs> yeah, right. They, they were they were ahead of the curve. They were uh, <laughs> they were uh, you know doing Zoom meetings before <laughs> before it was fashionable. Uh, so this is great. Um, but well, great. <laughs> this is great for Standard Oil. Uh, and this goes on for a while, but uh, slowly, but but then noticeably over the years, um, everybody starts to notice that like something's a little different about Rockefeller. Um, you know, he's always, he's always been like aloof, you know, famously he would do meetings, you know, during meetings, he would like lie down on a chaise lounge and have his eyes closed and people would think he's asleep, but then he would jump in. Oh, these are like standard oil board meetings. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But he's actually listening like intently to everything. Like he's always been a little weird, you know, in how he operates. Um, but super like laser focused and engaged in the business. Um, and, and he kind of starts like drifting away slowly and he seems weird. He starts not coming into the office every day. Uh, I think first he stops coming in on Saturdays (laughs) and, uh, then he like takes longer time off. Um, he, uh, he starts missing the, you know, the sacred like executive committee or gentlemen upstairs lunch meetings. Um, so people like, what's, what's going on? Um, and there really are two things happening to Rockefeller at this time. Um, you know, one is sort of like short-term good, but long-term bad. Uh, and the other one is short-term bad, but long-term good. So so first the, the long-term bad, but short-term good one. Um, I think, and you know, Chernow writes about this, like he kind of doesn't have anything left to prove at this point. Like he's outwitted everybody. <laughs> he's built the greatest thing of all time. You know, he's like, I was thinking about... Uh, uh, of course, we talked about you know the Jay Z Rockefeller connection last time, but it's like the Black Album with Jay Z, where he's like, "I'm retiring, I'm done." You know, like what more? Literally, what more can I say here? Uh, Chernow writes, "Quote in explaining his retirement, which this would lead to, the Rockefeller literature has always stressed his health and the heavy burden of his charities, though another factor contributed as well. He had perfected the gleaming machinery of Standard Oil." And his appointed task done, remember, he felt like this was his divine, you know, uh, duty from God. He felt he should pass the reins on to younger men. As Gates, who we'll talk about in a minute, put it, the business, quote, had ceased to amuse him. It lacked the freshness and variety and had become merely irksome. And he withdrew. So what you're saying is Rockefeller is really only like a zero to one guy and maybe like a <laughs> one to 10 guy and kind of like a 10 to 100 guy, but maybe not a 100 to a 1000 guy. Uh, maybe more like not like a, you know, 1000 to million guy. <laughs> or perhaps, I mean, he's already at scale. So it's most like he's not really a 1000 to 1100 guy. Yeah. I wonder if it's kind of like, you know, we'll talk about this much later in the episode, but this, I think this might be part of what you're seeing with all these big tech CEOs now. It's like... Bezos. What what more can I do here, guys? Like, yeah, and you know the public sentiment has to be weighing on Rockefeller too, where he's like, "Look, I believe in my heart of hearts that what I've done here is virtuous. Like, I truly believe this is my calling and what God wants me to do. I do believe that I've brought light to the world in a reliable, cheap way. I believe that I've provided a hundred thousand jobs, good jobs for people, and everyone hates me. And like, I, I don't think he was." necessarily overly concerned with other people's view of him like he was not a externally motivated man but that has to grate on you over time where you're you know working your ass off and you believe you're in the right at at least the vast majority of the time and yet the world is either espousing incredible hatred toward you or begging you for your money constantly so yeah i mean yeah he's just like it's just kind of not fun anymore Um, so he, he wants, we've alluded to this, he wants, and he tries to fully actually resign from the company. Uh, he, he talks to John Archibald, who he wants to take over. Um, 
and, and says like, you know, look, I, my heart's not in it anymore. I'm ready to go have another chapter in my life. Um, <laughs> but Archbold and, and some of the other executives, they're like, well, you know, your name on the, like, it really matters. Like, I think it would be bad for the troops, you know, and we've just had these, you know, brushes with the government. Um, I think it really would help things if it just, just in title only, you stay involved, you remain, you know, the president titularly of Standard Oil. <laughs> Ooh. And, and of course, that means you remain like the an officer of the company and all the liability that comes with that. And ju- just keep the title, man. Yeah, just the title. It's it's really to honor you. Oh, God. Oh, man. These, these, I was going to save this uh, little quip for later, but I'll use it now of um, you swim with the sharks, you sleep with the fishes. <laughs> uh, Archbold and, and Flagler and all these guys, they were they were something. So this was a very, very bad move for... Rockefeller and a freaking great move for all of the other execs, especially Archbold at uh, at Standard Oil. Uh, okay, so you said charity and like everybody asking, you know, John D for his money. Um, so this is the other piece of piece of this that that long term becomes just one of the greatest things to ever happen to America and and the world. I think. Um, but he's like. <laughs> he's really, really struggling with what to do with his wealth. And in particular, all these causes, you know, remember he wants to do great works. He feels called to God. He wants to, by God, he wants to make the money to then do great works with the money. And he's been donating all along the way, kind of in these smaller chunks, but like to everyone at church on Sundays, to the church to to maintain it. I mean, he's been, he's been charitable thus far. Yep. And it's kind of trained um people around him who he gives to organizations who he gives to and now the general public who knows about this that oh hey you can just ask john d for money and he might give you money um and he's super stressed out about this like i wouldn't find that very stressful if just constantly all he's getting thousands of letters a week uh, just asking for money he's not into the like cool billionaire stuff ideas like he doesn't really want it he wants to donate and so he's finding it like incredibly challenging that what he wants to do is find uh like high return on society ways to give this money away that align with his beliefs so he's you know looking for um either good sort of christian values ways to give it away or at least not anything that's antithetical to his beliefs but like the last thing that he wants to do is say, ah, there's there's too much inbound. I'm just going to ignore it. Like, no, he. this is his mission in life is to answer these pleas. Yep. Yeah. Chernow found this this great quote from him. And uh, I don't know if it was something he said to somebody or in his you know papers or whatnot. But uh, I think this really says, you know, says a lot about what he was, how he was feeling. He, so this is directly from Rockefeller about this time. I investigated and worked myself almost to a nervous breakdown in groping my way without sufficient guide or chart through the ever-widening field of philanthropic endeavor. It was forced upon me to organize and plan this department upon as distinct lines of progress as our other business affairs. Well, important to note here is like the notion of a philanthropic organization does not yet exist in America. Like there's not a professional... There's no Gates Foundation. There's no playbook for like, I'm going to start a 501c3 and employ people that work at this nonprofit that will figure out how to give the money away. It's it's kind of random and scattershot the way that everyone donates. And so there there is like, there's not a playbook of like, cool, I'll spin up this organization to give away my wealth. Yep. And he's doing it all himself. It's all on his shoulders. Uh, so literally, you know, his um, uh, folks might, might know who either were familiar before or have, you know, gone and looked up and, uh, John D on the internet since our, our part one, his appearance like radically changes during this time. So, you know, he was, um, you know, kind of like, uh, like devil bill. He had a lot of devil bill in him, uh, like a big guy, you know, very, uh, you know, he's, he's very like his personality is understated, but like he was, you know, a presence, uh, he starts shriveling up, he's losing weight. He, he gets, um, I think is it pronounced alopecia? Like he alopecia. literally he loses, loses his hair, all of his hair on his entire body, not just like his head, his eyebrows, his mustache. He always had a big bushy, bushy mustache. The rest of his body for the whole rest of his life, 
his hair is gone. And it's all just because of this stress that's weighing on him. And frankly, the incredible amount of work that he had done, you know, the, the, the standard oil had some trying times for him that that uh, he's not new to stress. Yep. But I, I think uh, this is really my interpretation here. You know, some I think comes from turnout, out, but, um, you know, like he loved standard. He loved every minute of standard oil. I think if it were just standard oil, I don't think any of this would have happened. I really think the weight of this wealth and this philanthropy like was like this albatross just like hanging around his neck. And let me give a quick uh, scope for a moment. When you say the weight of his wealth, let's talk about his wealth so far at this point in time and then we can check in later and update the numbers. So uh, in, uh, in 1890, he was generating $10 million in annual income just from standard oil dividends from a variety of sources and there so was the, no like almost no you know the percentage of the population that is in that level today is like infinitesimal and and, <laughs> and you know it's like 30x today like that the, the, these yeah, numbers it's just the, insane the other thing to think about is this is before the federal government enacted the income tax so this is 10 million post-tax dollars uh <laughs> He uh, not even post tax. There's the the concept right, right. of income. Well, but tax, it's like, like the, the notion of a post tax dollar yeah, today. It's just straight money. He really just has this like self perpetuating wealth because he owns two hundred and fifty seven thousand of the nine hundred and seventy three thousand shares of Standard Oil. So he owns a quarter of Standard Oil, and he's generating these dividends. Uh, at this point in time, I think Rockefeller was trying to keep it pretty modest. These like eleven percent annual dividends, but he himself was receiving $3 million in these annual dividends. He had $24 million invested outside of Standard Oil and things like railroads and real estate and steamships and like a dozen of each of these types of companies. He was in invested in banks like Chase Manhattan. He had a very close relationship there and 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 put a lot of money in there. But like he I think by the time he actually retires, he's worth about Two hundred million dollars. Yeah, and right around this, time, I think. Uh, gosh, I think this happened after he retired. I, I don't have it. In, I didn't write it down in my notes, uh, so I may get the timeline wrong. But I think it was after he retired. <laughs> in a roundabout way, he ends up owning a significant iron mining and ore deposit operation uh, that ends up getting rolled up into U.S. Steel when J.P. Morgan rolls up U.S. Steel. <laughs> JP Morgan, not the bank, the person rolls up uh, U.S. Steel, which is of course Carnegie Steel that he's rolling up into. Yep, exactly. And he makes eighty million on that transaction. Like eighty of his two hundred million dollars of wealth come from this U.S. Steel roll up that he was fortunate enough to have made an investment in this iron company. It's just wild. So he's got at this point, of course, owning a quarter of Standard Oil generating 10 million a year in annual income, got all these investments across all these industries, and then boom, U.S. Steel happens to him too. Man, strength leads to strength. For sure. I guess it applies to people too, and not just institutions. And one last comment on this Rockefeller wealth. You know, I mentioned we're still in sort of this 1890 to 1892 time frame, but uh, I mentioned that that point when he's worth 200 million in, in 1902. The GDP of the United States at that point was $24 billion. So even at that point, this is like, you know, there's still a lot of, there's still a decade before Standard Oil gets broken up and he owns a quarter of it. Uh, he already has 1% of the US's GDP as his personal <laughs> net worth. <laughs> oh, wow. Already the richest man that will ever, ex richest person that will ever exist in America, including Bezos, uh, all these people. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to see how things play out in the next, in the coming years. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, crazy. Uh, okay. So he's got all this weighing on him, you know, the, the sort of two, he's trying to be the best of the greatest of all time, trying to be the goat, the Tom Brady, if you will, <laughs> in both business and philanthropy. Um, finally in 1891, he, 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 he not gives up, but, but says like, I got to find a, a different way to make this work. And he convinces a man named Frederick Gates, 
who he had been working with on the University of Chicago project, which we'll talk about in a sec, to come move to New York and and help him with the philanthropic uh, endeavors that uh, that he's undertaking. And this is like um, this is so novel. Like this ends up you know creating. Uh, what leads to the Rockefeller Foundation, you know, a family office, all the stuff about how we think, oh yeah, this is how it's done today. <laughs> this is where it starts. Like uh, he he starts this whole thing. He and Gates. Um, he writes a letter to to Gates. He says, "I am in trouble, Mister Gates. The pressure of these appeals for gifts has become too great for endurance. I haven't the time or strength, with all my heavy business responsibilities, to deal with these demands properly. I am so constituted." as to be unable to give away money with any satisfaction until I have made the most careful inquiry as to the worthiness of the cause. These investigations are now taking more of my time and energy than Standard Oil itself. Either I must part with the burden or stop giving entirely, and I cannot do the latter. I mean, this that's, that sums it up right there. It's crazy to me that he's looking at this as... Uh, He's still the same old Rockefeller. He's obsessed with digging into every little detail, knowing how the money is going to be used. It's actually very similar to the the um, Buffett comparison that we made earlier. You think about the episode that we did with, I think it's Berkshire Hathaway part two, when he starts uh, donating some of his money. Like Warren was obsessed with analyzing the return on an investment. And so when he was going to donate, he was obsessed with understanding how can I maximize the impact of that investment, which of course was this large burden for him. And so that's why he ended up deciding, actually, I'm just going to go give it all to the Gates Foundation and they can figure it out and then I don't have to think about it. Whereas there is no, there are no foundations yet. So you have Rockefeller here with a similar obsession with making sure that it, every penny is deployed in the most optimal way, the, the way he did his whole business career. And how frustrating. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and I think there's one key difference, though, between Rockefeller and Buffett. I think they both have this outlook, but Buffett, I think, didn't and doesn't want, like, he doesn't have a genuine, like, want to be involved in it. Like, he he has this outlook. This is like, this is the way it should be. But like, I don't have a passion to do it myself. Rockefeller has the passion to do it himself too. Like he's he's like I want to re- run Standard Oil and <laughs> I want to like do this myself, but I need help. So he brings in Gates. And we should say like and what they go on to do, they basically invent philanthropy. Yes. Yes, they do. Like that is like like I think if they, you know, we're going to have so much fun on this episode still to come, but um I think if there's one thing to take away from this part too, it's like part 1 was Rockefeller and Standard Oil invented modern business. The thing to take away here is like they invent philanthropy and coming out of that is like so many cornerstones of what modern life is for all of us or almost all of us that are listening that we just take for granted. Yeah. And it's when we say invent philanthropy, they invent the sort of uh, systematic and organizational giving away of money. They don't invent tithing, you know, like that's a biblical concept, but but they really do invent modern philanthropy. Yeah. All right. So let's get into it. So the first big project, well, you know, as Ben, as you said, he had been giving all, all his life, even going back to his bookkeeping days, he was giving an amount. And um, the first significant project that uh, he and the family uh, do is actually Spelman uh, College was Spelman Seminary, what becomes Spelman College, the um, HBCU uh, Women's uh, College in Atlanta. Uh, in the early 1880s, they um, they 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 finance the building of that. Uh, and um, Spellman, uh, I didn't know this. Seti Spellman. Spellman is the maiden name of his wife, Seti Spellman. Yeah, uh, pretty amazing that that was the first like major project that they do. And I think they already, just to not over credit, I think they already had like a few hundred people enrolled, and they were raising money locally, and they just had some debts. And so Rockefeller came in and just wiped out all the debt, funded it. And then building the campus there, too. Pretty wild. I mean, it's the, it is the first liberal, liberal arts college for black women in America. Yeah, totally amazing. And also worth, worth pointing out about Rockefeller's character, which I find fascinating, because a lot of times you study people from this era, and they just have such, their, you know, they're a product of their time. And so they have a very low opinion of people that aren't white men. And Rockefeller does have some 
less savory parts uh, in, in reference to comments that he's made about sort of other ethnic groups here and there. But he went from like pre-Civil War being an abolitionist, a big supporter of Lincoln, to really like carrying that through and then putting his money where his mouth is and really advocating for the rights of black people after the Civil War. Yeah. It's almost silly to say this, but like for a rich white guy of the time, he's remarkably not racist. Yeah. He is like so much about him is remarkably modern (laughs) given the time and um it, and, you know, he doesn't, uh, like you say, he doesn't have a perfect track record on anything. And he doesn't have a perfect track record on, uh, you know, women and, and women's rights. <laughs> Most glaringly, I think they, he said he had five children. Uh, one died very young, four children that survived to adulthood. The three eldest were daughters. And then Ju- I think Junior was the youngest, uh, one son. <laughs> the daughters are like, yeah, you know, like, uh, fine, you can do stuff, whatever. But Junior, you're getting all the money and you're going to be my successor. Like, Very similar to the New York Times story in that respect where the money flowed through the male lineage. Yep, totally. But as you say, remarkably striking how close to modern um, he was in his sensibilities. Um, so that was that was Spellman. That was the first big project. <laughs> and then there's the University of Chicago. Uh which obviously is this amazing institution and achievement. <laughs> I think this project is really what put him over the edge psychologically, though. This was hard. Um, so it started, I didn't know anything about this history. So um, it started in the early 1880s. There was this movement to build a true Baptist university in America. And remember, Rockefeller's Baptist, you know, all the Ivy League schools. Uh, you know, started as you know, religious or quasi-religious institutions, but they weren't Baptist, uh, with the exception of Brown. Brown had a lot of Baptist um, influence, and that's where Junior, Rockefeller's son, went. Um, but it wasn't strictly Baptist, I don't think. There was, they wanted to build like a real Baptist university. And the Ivy Leagues at this point in time are becoming more and more secular. Like it's a, they're, they're sort of, the, the Baptist educational community is sort of worried about uh, uh oh, what's about to take off is this sort of secular education movement, and all the best and brightest are going to flock to those types of institutions. And remember, you know, what did we say the first time about the Baptists? They're evangelical. They want to, like, you know, it's not about the wealth per se, but it's, a, you know, they want to recruit. And so this movement is like, we want to put this university in New York City. <laughs> like, <laughs> the part, you know, attract everybody, the big city, America, post war, et cetera. JD, of course, is the perfect benefactor for this. So he gets involved. Uh, it becomes a mess. <laughs> the guy who's running it, um, a guy uh, running the the initiative, a guy named Augustus Strong, who's a Baptist minister, <laughs> he ends up sort of scheming. Um, uh, <laughs> Rockefeller's oldest daughter, uh, Bessie, ends up marrying his son. Uh, so they get like very involved. But then the project falls apart and Rockefeller withdraws his support awkward um it eventually does morph into trying to build this project in chicago instead and the idea is that you know (laughs) so we think chicago is the midwest like it was the west then like you know the frontier uh but it was the biggest city in the frontier i think it was already the second biggest city in america at that point that here was sort of new ground we can build this baptist university and then it'll be a model a template and we'll build a bunch more Baptist universities all over the country. And two more benefits, too. One of which is it's really expensive to build stuff in Manhattan. And so it's a lot cheaper to get building materials out there and hire construction crews. And then, of course, you have Rockefeller who really wants to do these good works because he thinks they're the right things to do, not because he thinks he's repenting for some business sins that he's done. And he's like really, really afraid of anything that looks like I'm doing a charitable thing in order to curry public favor so they don't hate me for the business. Like anytime anybody would insinuate like, well, this is a good way for you to make up for all the Standard Oil stuff. He would just like excommunicate them. And so it was convenient that it was in Chicago because he sort of felt like, if it's in New York, then people will sort of view it as me trying to influence the public to like me, and I don't want to be seen as attempting to do that. So you're saying like 
the opposite of what Rockefeller wants might be something like, um, oh, I don't know, like Leland Stanford University or <laughs> Vanderbilt University or Duke University, all wonderful institutions. I, I went to one of them. Uh, but uh, yeah, these are uh, these are people who want their names on the building, so to speak. And like for most listeners, I bet you're like, wait. Rockefeller started, founded the University of Chicago, and that is exactly what he was going for. And it wasn't just universities, right? So like, obviously, probably some of you are thinking like, well, you're talking about how Rockefeller pioneered philanthropy and all that. But like, they, you guys are missing something. There was another wealthy white dude at the time who was pretty dang philanthropic, Andrew Carnegie, of course, and, and they were big time rivals. Uh you know, Carnegie did something pretty amazing. He created the American public library system. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know how there's like a library in every town in America? Like that's huh. Carnegie. He created those libraries and funded I assume them. that was like taxes. <laughs> I guess no. it probably is funded by taxes, like public libraries. Well, I think they're, you know, government institutions uh, today, but... um but they were created and sort of given to America. And he also did uh, internationally, too, um, created a, a bunch of library systems um, by Carnegie. <laughs> but, uh, you know, one of the reasons for sure that he did that is like, how do you make sure your name goes down in history? <laughs> Get a plaque or a statue in front of a big building in every town in America with your name on it. <laughs> that was not Rockefeller's style. Yeah. This is at the time, sort of a nebulous concept, but he wanted what he was doing to really be like Standard Oil in that, you know, what did, what did Standard Oil do? They had all of these different operations, you know, in different states, but also different companies. Remember, they, they bought up all these other companies and it wasn't that they like absorbed them wholeheartedly or, you know, wholesale, a uh, whole cloth, um, they kept operating these individual companies on their own with support from the mothership, but they were expected to be profitable, have good tight operations in a decentralized manner. They would just have to pass a quality bar for making sure that they, were, they had good, reliable product, and then they would slap the standard brand on it. Yep. And the standard brain, what was, what was standard itself? It was about setting the standard. It was about creating, uh, you know, doing this sort of quote unquote research to create the best processes that would get to get disseminated out to the decentralized organization that's what he wants for philanthropy uh and so once he brings gates in they start thinking about this and they turn their attention to the state of medicine uh and health in america and in the world they do something pretty amazing so in 1901 they decide to set up the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research in New York City. This is amazing. They buy a farm. <laughs> they buy a farm on the east side of Manhattan, uh, uh, overlooking uh, overlooking the East River uh, in the in the six like the upper sixties. <laughs> you know, like literally in the middle of Manhattan, there's this farm, and they set up this research, it's this medical research institution there, uh, and the idea is. It's not going to be, it's going to be pure, basic research. Uh, and sure now is this great, great quote of Rockefeller talking to, to his son, to Junior. He says, John, we have money, but it will have value for mankind only if we can find able men with ideas, imagination, and courage to put it into productive use. Rockefeller placed the scientists at this institution, not the trustees, in charge of expenditures. And this was revolutionary. This was the Institute's secret formula. Gather great minds, liberate them from petty cares, and let them chase intellectual chimeras without pressure or meddling. If the founders created an atmosphere conducive to creativity, things would presumably happen. <laughs> so at this little research institution, goes on to become rockefeller university <laughs> ben had you heard of rockefeller university before we did the research for this i hadn't and i've been blown away by the amount of medical research that's come out of it so a small sample this i'm just gonna like read from wikipedia here if you go to the wikipedia entry for rockefeller university these are the things that have come out of this 
<laughs> in no particular order. First, to culture the infectious agent associated with syphilis showed that viruses can be oncogenic, which enabled the field of tumor biology, identified the genetic defect associated with arteriosclerosis, the leading cause of heart attacks in the U.S., development of the practice of travel vaccination, identified the phenomenon of autoimmune disease, developed virology as an independent field, <laughs> developed the first peptide antibiotic, <laughs> crazy. Uh, showed that genes are structurally composed of DNA, discovered blood groups, <laughs> just uh, casual, all just the blood groups that all the blood they groups. exist. Yeah. Uh, developed methadone as treatment of heroin addiction and devised the AIDS drug cocktail. Uh, Whoa, really? Yes, really. <laughs> uh, so this, this institute, it wasn't until the 50s that it would become Rockefeller University. So during Rockefeller's life, he never created a or intended to create a university with his name on it. Uh, but, um, you know, here's much later. This is a quote from Winston Churchill talking about John Rockefeller. When history passes its final verdict on John D. Rockefeller, it may well be that his endowment of research will be recognized as a milestone in the progress of the race. For the first time, science was given its head. Longer term experiment on a large scale has been made practicable, and those who undertake it are freed from the shadow of financial disaster. Science today owes as much to the rich men of generosity and discernment as the art of the Renaissance owes to the patronage of popes and princes. Of these rich men, John D. Rockefeller is the supreme type. Boom. That is a pretty ringing endorsement. Winston Churchill. Yeah, Winston Churchill. So like this, you know, this is very far from, uh, you know, what all these other philanthropic folks had in mind. It's also like diametrically opposed to the University of Chicago project, where that was like super high overhead, you know, a uh, big deal out of the gate, a lot of pomp and circumstance. And with the Rockefeller University or what would become that, it was it was almost like the lean startup. Yeah. Like you've never heard of it. And they didn't make a big deal at the beginning and they didn't build a special campus and they didn't. It was very much like, let's get a bunch of really smart people, the brightest in their field together. We'll pay them good money and like we'll kind of see. Let them come here and work on what they want to work on. We're not telling them what to work on. Uh, so uh, in its you know, 110, 120 year history, um, there have been 38 Nobel laureates that have either come through or been produced by the Institute uh, and then the university. Uh, so there's all this basic research that they're doing. They go even further. So the first head of the Institute who they recruited was this guy named Simon Flexner. And Flexner was a physician. Uh, he had been, he was teaching at Penn and he'd been educated at Johns Hopkins, which was really the only like real medical teaching institution in America at the time. Remember, like <laughs> this is, you know, we're talking about how modern Rockefeller is and how modern Standard Oil is and how modern this philanthropy is. <laughs> Remember his father, you know, Bill, uh, was a doctor, quote unquote, like he was a, like a witch doctor. Like that's what medicine in the practical sense looked like in America. You know, it was really closer to that at this time still. I mean, at, at best it was homeopathy. At best, at best, which Rockefeller was actually sympathetic to himself uh, for a long time. But um, so, you know, they, Gates and, and Rockefeller and the family, they work with Flexner and they say, how can we, you know, we've done all this research in this science. How can we change how medicine is practiced? So they go to Hopkins. They take the Johns Hopkins model, which is four years, you know, what we know as medical school today, four years post undergrad. And they spread it out. They don't go create another <laughs> university to teach another medical school. They go create medical schools at all the other universities in America uh, with this model. Um, uh, you know, before this, other uh, medical schools, you didn't need a college degree. There was no standardization. There was like there was no no faculty standards. Um, so they go first to the University of Chicago, then to Yale, then to Vanderbilt, then to all these other institutions and they just give tens of millions of dollars so they just start medical schools to start medical schools in the model of 
Johns Hopkins. Uh, and, and this creates, you know, modern practical medicine as, as we know it today. Then they go even further in the teens and twenties, um, you know, after world war one, uh, they're concerned about like, you know, there's, there's the practice of medicine, but there's also a broad, there's like public health <laughs> is a thing. So <laughs> they go back to Hopkins and they say, we will fund creating a new school here attached to the medical school, a public health school. <laughs> so they create the first like, you know, school of public health at Hopkins. And then they go to Harvard and they do the same thing there. So the Harvard, you know, school of public health. Uh, and then they go again out to all the rest of the universities in the country and around the world. Uh, and it's all behind the scenes like this. So like, this is so Rockefeller and so standard oil, like, you know, and is this being sort of managed by Frederick Gates? Yeah. yeah. Gates and and now the Rockefellers, like Junior gets very involved in this and ultimately takes it over. Um, but Senior and Junior and Gates, the three of them together, along with the staff that they're building, uh, they're driving all of this. It's awesome. So listeners, as you can tell by now, Standard Oil Part 2 is really like Rockefeller Part 2. I mean, we're dancing in and out of Standard Oil here, but there's the scope of what the early, you know, Standard Oil money allowed the Rockefeller family to do is just unbelievable. Yep. Uh, and, then, and then to, you know, sort of put a, a bow on all of this here, in 1913, so they're thinking the whole time, they're like, how do we really institutionalize this? You know, seniors getting older, uh, they built up this office, this is unique. How do we, how do we make this something that's going to perpetuate indefinitely? They set up in 1913, they get a charter from the state of New York. I don't know exactly how this works. I think it was a federal charter granted in the state of New York to create the Rockefeller Foundation, which still exists to this day. They give away hundreds of millions of dollars a year to causes from medicine to education to the arts to all sorts of things. So if there's some public, you know, good cause in America or around the world, like there's a good chance that it was funded at least at some point in time by the Rockefeller Foundation. It's also because it's been privately held this whole time. We also don't have an exact figure of like what the sum of all these different pockets of Rockefeller family wealth are worth. It's really, I mean, it's it's kind of astonishing that we don't, but we don't. Like there, there have been scholars who have tried to pour into this and, and there are estimates, but it's uh, it's tough. Yeah. And, and this model, you know, <laughs> endowments today from university endowments to all sorts of other charitable foundations. Uh, this is, this is the model they follow. So, um, I think, I think that's probably where we should leave it. Right, Ben? Um, you know, Rockefeller standard oil, he won business. He's won philanthropy. He's won like America. It's <laughs> kind of nothing more to see here, right? You know, everybody lives happily ever after. Not quite. Eh, not quite. Not quite. I, uh, I was waiting for the right moment to use this in the episode. I think this is the right time. The one and only, you know, Ben, you've been on the the mafia movie uh, and content kick, you know, the Godfather and all that in your carve outs. I think it's time to bring in the one um, good part of Godfather part three. <laughs> <laughs> just when i thought i was out they, they pulled pull me, me back, back in, in. <laughs> yeah yeah you shouldn't have stayed the president <laughs> <laughs> should not have left your name on the door should not have left your name on the door john should we tell the story yeah let's do it all right here we go <laughs> the breakup of standard oil so let's review a few numbers before diving into the breakup story so Rockefeller had sort of handed over to to Archbold, you know, the the day to day of of running the company. That modest eleven percent dividend, Archbold's a pretty big shareholder. All his friends are pretty big shareholders. That ratcheted up to thirty one percent in eighteen ninety seven, and then thirty three percent in eighteen ninety nine. So we are cutting big dividend checks to all these uh, these shareholders. Which Rockefeller actually was not happy about, <laughs> no, paradoxically. No, he liked keeping it super modest, keeping the cash in the business, reinvesting it. The share price, so this is interesting, it's not a publicly traded company, and so we don't get to see the books 
But shares do change hands. But shares do change hands. And so every day in the newspaper, uh, a, a share price is published at which it's kind of the reference price that, that people are are deciding to trade. The share price went from 100... It's like a direct offering. Yes. $176 in 1896 to then three years later, $458. So the stock is running, as they say. Hmm. So you've got this... That's a nice uh, Tesla-like move there. Yes. Uh, you, which not really like the number, the, the, the stock movements that we're seeing today in, in meme stocks is, is just a totally different multiple than we're talking about here, but unbelievable three year run from 176 to 458. You then sort of look at that dividend policy, uh, and you're like, well, how much of that, is, you know, is there in total from 1893 to 1901, they paid out $250 million to shareholders. Keep in mind, Rockefeller is making 25% of that. Like he's upset, <laughs> but he's also making just a crap ton of money. And so the, the thing to sort of land on here is this is all before the automobile. Like this is all still the kerosene business. And there's this, this like seminal point right around 1898 where cars start happening like it starts working we go from 800 cars in 1898 to then two years later 8,000 cars and so it's starting to happen standard oil is realizing wait a minute we finally can use this useless gasoline product and so even in his retirement rockefeller's real wealth ends up getting piled on top of his sort of paltry wealth that we talked about earlier from the uh mass market adoption of the internal combustion engine yep 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 so right around that time when the automobile was taking off this is also the crazy thing you know like there's two um <laughs> there's two parts to the breakup story that we're going to talk about here you know <laughs> they're both good <laughs> for everybody uh one is the breakup uh which is good <laughs> very good and two is the automobile, which is very good. And they happen like right at the same, like on the same parallel paths. So in 1897, right as this run up in the auto industry is starting, uh, and right as JD had fully, you know, tried to walk away uh, from the business, uh, <laughs> good old state of Ohio, they bring charges again back to the you know the top of the show here they're like okay you guys moved to new jersey but like still you're still like breaking our laws <laughs> we still don't like you uh and so what they do is um somebody like a government official tries to go they get a hold of some old trust shares and they try and go redeem the shares of the trust to get they're like oh well uh you know if you did what you said you were going to do i should be able to go get shares in Standard Oil, New Jersey, and then there's the holding company of underlying, you know, all of these other companies and they can't actually do it. So they're like, aha, you guys, you defrauded everybody. So they bring a case. Rockefeller actually gets called to testify in this case. <laughs> and he puts on this great show. He pretends to be this like doddering old man who's senile and like can't remember anything <laughs> it's amazing oh when he's on the stand it's like it's like he's like wandering through the mist oh i can't remember oh it's been uh it's he goes from the, like one of the sharpest brightest people to ever live in american history to seemingly having no recollection of really how anything kind of came together yep Oh God! How did that? How did that happen? I, you know, where are those trust shares? Gosh, I, I don't know, Mister Prosecutor. <laughs> uh, the um, uh, the state doesn't actually win the case, uh, but it's it's again, it's like kind of a distraction. It starts to move public opinion, which is what really counts: the court of public opinion against Standard Oil. Uh. But they win, and everybody's like, oh, okay, fine. Like, you know, <laughs> we're going to make it. Uh, <laughs> also, oh, this is just so good. At the same time as this case is going on, there's a presidential election happening. Uh, it was actually when it started, and 1896 was the election. And uh, there's a really terrifying figure from Standard's 
a Standard Oil's point of view, running for president here. William Jennings Bryan, the celebrated, the OG populist. His thing was um, America was going to get crucified on a cross of gold, right? That was his... Uh, yep, populism and silver. That's like his. Yep. Uh, <laughs> it's like the two things I remember from American history about him. Oh, motherhood and apple pie. <laughs> that and he was like around forever. Like somehow he yes. showed up in like... I was like, how is this guy still alive? Like he was in the American national political scene for decades and decades and decades. Hmm, still alive. Hmm. Just a striking choice of words there. So Brian loses, uh, of course, doesn't become president. And who does become president? The best person that like Standard and all these other trusts and like JP Morgan and Carnegie and everybody could imagine. William McKinley, the celebrated conservative who Standard Oil contributed. Republican from Ohio. Yep. Yep. Good old boy. Standard contributed a cool quarter million dollars to his campaign. Everybody is just pumped. Uh, His campaign manager, McKinley's campaign manager, a guy named Mark Hanna, actually went to high school with John D. back when he was going to high school before uh, Wild Bill pulled him out. Uh, And he's like deep, deep in in the family with these guys. He sends a telegram when McKinley wins that literally reads, God is in his heaven. All is right with the world. <laughs> <laughs> That's a gloating telegram if I've ever seen one. Oh, my God. There is fist bumping going on all over the place. McKinley is just like literally sent from God here from standards perspective. Fast forward a couple of years, though. <clears throat> All's good on the federal level. But we start getting some trouble with the states again. And this time it's not Ohio. This time it is right close to the new new home, the actual home in New York. It is in New York when the feisty new governor of New York starts making some noises about coming after the trust, in particular, the oil trust with Standard Oil. None other than Theodore Roosevelt, the new governor of New York, which I didn't realize like what he did before becoming president. And I didn't realize he was th- involved in bringing this suit against Standard Oil. Ooh, was He was he was very involved. <laughs> it's like if 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 uh, Rockefeller was bad, there's a chance Theodore Roosevelt was badder. Oh, he was the ultimate badass. <laughs> uh, I mean, literally like I was going to save this for a minute from now, but like, oh my God. Once again, Andy Sparks on Twitter, the best, reminded me <laughs> that Theodore Roosevelt, a little, like all the glee that we had in part one for Rockefeller and Standard Oil and Flagler and like all these uh, mafia dons and everything that they're doing, <laughs> Roosevelt, you're going to have just an equal glee on the other side. He, when he was campaigning, um, Uh, This is actually later in life (laughs) when he was unsuccessfully running for president uh, later in life. Uh, (laughs) He gets shot before a speech. He literally gets shot in the chest. Oh, that's right. And he gives the speech anyway, right? And he's he's on the way to deliver the speech. He's being driven. He gets shot by a botched assassination attempt. He's got a bullet in his chest. The driver starts to divert and take him to the hospital. And he's like, oh, no, no, young man. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to give that speech. <laughs> he goes to the speech. Uh, he goes to the, the venue and he sort of starts the speech. And he's like, <laughs> I'd like everybody to be as quiet as possible. I don't know if y'all realize that I was just shot. <laughs> and he gives the speech and then he goes to the hospital. Uh, amazing. I mean, this is like, oh, Teddy Roosevelt's the best. Uh, There's a great uh, David McCullough biography about him. Yeah. I think is, is it mornings on horseback? Is that the? Oh, I think that that might be one? it. That sounds yeah. that sounds familiar. Uh, I, I've been to his uh, his uh, his home, his his uh, estate. Oh, in, where uh, Sagamore Hill? I think it is called. It's on Long Island. Huh. Um, cool. It's super cool. There's like a uh, you know, uh, this was before um, Teddy also had you know uh, by modern standards a problematic figure in his all of his hunting and you know all of yeah, that. I was gonna say, are there pelts uh, everywhere? Uh, my favorite is there's a trash can made of an elephant hoof. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> crazy! Uh, so, um, all right. So this is the guy. This is the guy that is going to challenge. This is John the So, Standard and the business community and Mark Hanna, they come up with a brilliant, genius solution to their new problems from Roosevelt 
in the state of New York. Remember, they like control the Republican Party at this point. <laughs> they get Roosevelt nominated as the vice president on the ticket for McKinley's reelection campaign in 1900. This will get rid of him. This will get rid of him, like send him to be VP. You know, it'll be like great for his political career, but you're going to get him out of New York. <laughs> and everybody knows VPs do basically, basically not right. Put him in the corner. Put him in the corner. Now, of course, McKinley wins in, wins in a landslide again. Problem solved. Everybody's high fiving. What year is this? This is, you know, the fall of 1900 when um, when uh, the election happens. It's all great. McKinley gets reinaugurated uh, in 1901. And then he gets shot and he dies. <laughs> Oops. Uh, uh, unlike Roosevelt, he does not survive. Did the Secret Service exist yet? Like, are they are they bad at their jobs or are they just not around yet? That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. Such a wild world. And also that this would like continue for ever, you know, oh, not forever, but like, you know, what? Reagan got shot, right? Like, was he the last president to actually be That's a good question. Shot? I yeah, they seem so. to catch him early now. Yeah, goodness. Um, <laughs> obviously, we don't. I don't mean to make light of you know McKinley being shot and dying, but um, this is not good <laughs> for like literally the worst yeah. nightmare. So, suddenly, public possible. enemy number one or private enemy number one for Standard Oil is now in the White House. Yes, now in the White House. Uh, <laughs> so TR. I mean, I'm sure everybody's upset about the assassination and whatnot, but like. Well, once he, you know, gets done with mourning, he's like, oh, you MFers, I've got you right where I want you now. Uh, and he's about to get some serious ammo because right at the same time, literally the same month that TR is inaugurated as president, September 1901, a amazing pioneering woman journalist named Ida Minerva Tarbell, who's a writer for McClure's magazine, National Magazine, it's going to be important, National Magazine, uh, starts working on a new project that she pitches to the editor, McClure. Uh, the History of Standard Oil as a book to come out in serial form in the magazine. Now, one might say Ida has an ax to grind from uh, her own past. Mm, yeah, what was her past? Well, we'll get into that in one sec. But this, I mean, this is amazing. Like, uh, this is the birth of a investigative journalism uh, as we know it today. Um, uh, Daniel Jurgen, the great historian who wrote The Prize, which so many people have recommended after part one that we that we read. Uh, we Ben, you you read a little bit of it. Yeah, I quickly realized like, oh, this is like mostly about U.S. Saudi Arabia relations, and we are so not going to get to that in part two. Yeah. So we'll we'll have to do cover the prize and, and all of, you know the rest of the international oil history another time. Uh but he, you know, celebrated historian, he calls this book, The History of Standard Oil, quote, maybe the single most influential book on business ever published in the United States. Uh amazing. Um she becomes uh, I Tarbell uh and her colleagues at McClure at McClure's become known as the muckrakers you know if you've heard the term muckraking journalists oh, yeah. uh this is she's them um do you know who coins the term muckrakers Ooh, no i don't teddy roosevelt himself no way <laughs> yes so great he gives a speech and he, he talks about about how great they are uh yeah so she was this amazing character now you said she might have some agenda <laughs> uh shall we say some bias yes. a little bit of personal history to color you know her her point of view here. Yeah. So where where is uh where is Ida from? Uh, you know she's like this this international woman. She lives in Paris for a while, but she's you know based in New York. She's writing for this erudite magazine, uh, but her her roots are actually somewhere sort of close to home in this story. Kind of Western Pennsylvania area. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like the the wild you know East back in the day. Yeah. She grew up in Titusville, <laughs> and her dad was an oil refiner right not only did she grow up in titusville while the beginnings of the oil, oil industry were, were happening her dad was a a producer like a, a driller uh who like got totally flattened by standard oil and was one of the leaders of the like 
riots, uh, I, I, like the rebellion against the South Improvement Company stuff and everything that was going on at that point in time. And I don't know if you knew this, not only her dad, her brother goes into the oil business and her brother becomes a senior executive at Pure Oil. Which is like the most legitimate competitor to Standard, right? I don't think we talked about this in part one. Uh, part of the strategy was they got to like 90-ish percent market share uh, in refined oil uh, products uh, uh, you know, coming out of the U.S., uh, they didn't want to get to 100% because they wanted to keep up some charade of competition. Totally. It's like having Bing out there in the search engines. Exactly. <laughs> Sorry, Bing. Uh, so the Bing of Standard Oil was pure oil that they allowed to survive. <laughs> and guess who's a senior executive there? William Ida's Walter Tarbell. Brother. Ida's brother. <laughs> By the way, I do have the like actual stat that we pulled from um, PitchBook sent us this great tear sheet that Standard Oil controlled 91% of oil refinement in 1904 and 85% of even the final sales. Wow. Wow. Monopoly. <laughs> uh, you said it. Uh, so, I, you know, she's got this uh, agenda, one might say. Um, but she is a like very serious journalist. So she spends a year just researching the history she wants to find like what is the real history like nobody's uncovered how this actually went down <laughs> well and she starts by by going to titusville to rekindle her roots and remember what it was like and like stew up some feelings of anti uh, rockefeller before embarking on doing this totally so Chernow writes uh from the perspective of nearly a century later ida tarbell's series remains the most impressive thing ever written about standard oil uh, that is like High praise. I mean, yeah. Century late, like so much ink has been spilled, but for for Chernow to say this is the most impressive thing ever written. I almost ordered the book, by the way, but I was like, this is going to be way too hard to read. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, well, we'll just take Chernow's word for it here. I, I trust him. He continues a tour de force of reportage that dissects the trust's machinations with withering clarity. She laid down a clear chronology provided a trenchant account of how the combine had evolved and made the convoluted history of the oil industry comprehensible. In the dispassionate manner associated with McClure's, she sliced open America's most secretive business and showed all the hidden gears and wheels turning inside it. <laughs> it remains one of the great case studies of what a single journalist armed with the facts can do against seemingly invincible powers uh and this was just like this was such this is like a freaking nuclear bomb <laughs> goes off in uh in standard oil and and around the country like this captivates america it was like you know like right now like the the uh elizabeth holmes trial is going on and like theranos like that was nothing it is nothing compared to this right it's like that trial meets like the half decade long uh you know, pitchforks against Facebook and the privacy plus the anti-Amazon sentiment. Like there there, there were no equivalent companies to Standard Oil. There were other trusts that rose up and, and sort of were uh, uh, following their business practices, but no one as big or as bad or as loathed by, uh, by America as the Standard Oil Trust. It runs for 19... Monthly installments. So for like almost two years, uh, the I don't have the exact numbers here, but the circulation of McClure's like increased, like it like triples or quadruples during this time. Like it grows by hundreds of thousands of people. And remember, it's national. Like this is new, you know. Like in the past, you like standard it, you know, they, they didn't really care about the press, right? Because it was all like you know local stuff or like you know whatever. Like we can crush all this. So there's a delicious piece of irony in this being a national publication. Like we do have this unbelievable, unprecedented period in the early 1900s where you have the like golden era of media, of magazines, of newspapers. And when you think about it, like, well, what's the media business model that was the winning one at the time? It was advertising, and so you got all these corporations and trusts that are making all this profit. And what they're doing is they're advertising to potential consumers in these publications who now have all these consumer eyeballs. And they're like, we got to get like really epic stories to tell. And so it's like literally the profitability of the business model that Standard pioneered that is 
funding the organizations that are now coming after them. And it's like, oh, the parallels today are so good. I was, I was on um, the wire cutter the other day, which is fantastic. Love the wire cutter. Um, you know, owned by the New York Times. <laughs> they have affiliate links on the wire cutter. Great acquisition. Great acquisition to Amazon, right? Like, you know, Amazon, Facebook, all the like the, you know, the press today is coming after these companies in many ways, you know, rightly so, although not like they don't have their own agendas too. Uh <laughs> they're taking advertising from yeah. them too. Like it's crazy. Uh, so crazy. So uh in the history, Tarbell <laughs> uncovers and documents exactly how the Cleveland massacre went down. Uh which remember um if you remember from part one, we read a a, a quote, sort of fictionalized quote of how Standard approached the independent refiners in Cleveland with like, hey, you got two choices here. We can crush you or we can buy you out at like a valuation that we ascribe. That quote came from oh, yeah. this history. We wouldn't know these things. Like this whole, all the stuff we said in part one, like we wouldn't know without Ida because the only other real account is Rockefeller talking to his official biographer, William O. Inglis. Which was never published uh, during the time. Right, toward the end of his life. And like he doesn't, he only sort of breaks character once or twice. And he really doesn't, like, it's really not that interesting or not that spicy of a story. And still he says, you know what? Actually, there's too much here. You should just store it in the family archives. And so like it doesn't, come out and it end up, ends up just being a source for future biographers in the future after they get the family's permission. So like it really is Ida Tarbell who discovered all the stuff that we've talked about. I mean, there's lots of big stuff that she uncovers. The fact that there were secret subsidiaries that were nominally, you know, people thought were competitors of Standard Oil, but were actually owned by Standard Oil. Um, she finds out that they're still like currently at the time engaging in illegal practices with the railroads uh, there's a whole there's a whole thing about how um, uh, they they sneak papers out of uh, I think the Cleveland office of Standard Oil, uh, showing that uh, the railroads are sending information about competitors shipments to Standard Oil offices. Um, that that comes out in the piece. So <laughs> you were talking about the you know, national and all that. <laughs> the the fact that this was a national magazine. Standard uh, and Rockefeller, when all this comes out, even though the antitrust cases are going on, they don't do anything. You know, their playbook, they've never been faced with something like this before. And the standard response is silence. <laughs> they don't they don't respond, they don't mount a counter campaign, even though there's a lot of stuff in in the in Tarbell's history that's wrong that they very legitimately could have taken issue with. Yeah, and it's interesting that like that strategy works until some boiling over point. Like it actually it reminds me a lot of Apple. Like if you think back to um Antenna Gate as a great example where like Apple doesn't comment on rumors one way or another because if they say that a rumor's not true, then it means that, you know, it uh, it substantiates all the ones that they don't comment on. But then you have something like Antenna Gate where like it wasn't as big a deal, but it was a deal. And so Steve Jobs flies back from vacation on Hawaii with his family to hold a next, you know, same week press conference about it. And it's like there, there is some boiling over point where like, if you don't say something, it is way worse. You hit the nail on the head, like up to a certain point, saying something makes you look guilty. But then past a certain point, not saying something makes you look guilty <laughs> and standard past this point. So not saying anything made them look super freaking guilty in the eyes of the public you know and to be fair they they were guilty of a lot of stuff um <laughs> so the other so that's how they respond to the the tarbell piece yeah then on the roosevelt pressure front you know the first roosevelt's first term goes by and and miraculously they manage to skate by nothing like major happens in terms of breaking on the antitrust front even though roosevelt wants wants it to uh so when he's running for election in the 1904 campaign, which would be the first, you know, sort of mandate for him from the people, <laughs> Standard tries to run the same playbook they've always run. They cozy up to him and they're like, Teddy, <laughs> let's all be friends here. 
<laughs> we've got a lot of money. You know, this is big for you. This is your first selection on a national stage. You could really use our support. How about we make some campaign donations? And Roosevelt's campaign managers, they're like, sure, we could use the money. We'll take the money. <laughs> and they do. Uh, <laughs> but and, and Standard wasn't the only trust to do this. All the other big trusts did this too. Um, <laughs> the best quote. Oh, this is this is one of my favorite quotes in all of Titan, uh, which is actually from Henry Frick, who was an executive at, at U.S. Steel, about what happens here. Uh, <laughs> Chernow writes that uh, Frick summed up the situation best after the election with the quote. We bought the son of a bitch, but he wouldn't stay bought. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. And who's Frick? Uh, Frick is, uh, I can't remember if he was running U.S. Steel at the point or if he was a senior executive at U.S. Steel. So not not standard, but uh, not standard oil. But uh, that's this right. Was I think, the- yeah, he's the one that like got Rockefeller and and, Jun- and Rockefeller's son, Rockefeller Jr. on the board of directors of U.S. Steel. Ah, uh, yeah, I think that's right. They were all, you know, buddies. Yep. Um, so after the election, which Roosevelt wins, wins in a landslide, because um, he's got the support of business behind him, uh, now he's like, all right, I've got the mandate. I'm going to make this happen. Uh, so right after he's re-inaugurated in, um, in February 1905, the U.S., the Congress passes a unanimous resolution urging individual states to conduct antitrust investigations into standard oil uh and immediately a whole bunch of states bring cases including missouri which is where everything eventually ends up going down great state of missouri uh they subpoena jd to come uh in and testify uh in front of a grand jury in these this investigation (laughs) <laughs> JD, he he obviously doesn't want to do this so he goes into hiding he literally goes on the lamb <laughs> uh at the same time the state of ohio actually they go a step further they issue a warrant for rockefeller's arrest <laughs> it's so crazy like it's the world's wealthiest man it's not like he's leaving the country or anything but he's just trying to like say super low key about where he is he disappears like literally there are there are process servers trying to serve him with the subpoena and the warrant for his arrest all over the country trying to track him down they're they're jumping over the fence of i think it's patantico hills where he like his residence in new york like there's some servant or something who sees this like person leap over the fence and fall and they're like can we help you (laughs) uh so he's like he won't even tell his family where he is like the the standard oil executives don't know where he is um it's amazing he just disappears for like two years (laughs) um during this time he's sending letters with no return address like constantly to 26 broadway to archbold and to all the other directors of standard oil being like guys I actually want to resign. Like he's sending letter, he's sending his letter of resignation <laughs> like perpetually, like every week. It's crazy because at the same time, he's like building all these medical u- universities and like medical schools that are attached to all these other colleges. And, and these the, thousands of letters are coming in asking for money and he's dodging the government because they keep trying to get him in court. It's, he's like a Bond villain. It's amazing. It's crazy. It's so great. Uh, so uh, Archbold. Oh, my God. Archbold. This is the other place I was going to have the swim with the sharks and you sleep with the fishes uh, line. Um, you know, they refuse to let him resign. They're like, mm, nah, I don't know where you are. Sorry, bud. <laughs> There's no freaking way. Well, and at this point, those guys are a lot of them are sort of like defending themselves and throwing him on the Rockefeller to the bus. They're, they're saying, Oh, standard oil may have acted in this, you know, in this illegal way. But like, I certainly didn't. You even have executives at standard oil talking and giving first party accounts to Ida Tarbell to Tarbell. Yes. To try and shield themselves. Exactly. So the, the primary guy who, who talked to Tarbell and did this was a executive. And I think a board member um, named Henry Rogers and Chernow finds this quote. I think he gave this, I think he said this to Tarbell. Uh, <laughs> this quote from Rogers says, quote, we told him, Rockefeller, JD, 
that he had to keep the title of president. These cases against us were pending in the courts. And we told him if any of us had to go to jail, he would have to go with us. <laughs> <laughs> it's the freaking mafia. It's amazing. Oh, my God. Uh, so this is it. There's no, you know, Rockefeller. He can stay on the run. He can stay on the lamb as long as he wants. But like the the jig is up it's like the this is like the end of the sopranos where uh, i forget whatever the situation was but like tony's getting whacked here <laughs> like standard oil is getting whacked we don't uh, know if tony was whacked yeah right okay <laughs> we, we don't know <laughs> but i thought they didn't the show's producers say at some at and some then they that, unsaid it oh and then they unsaid well, they, they it. said oh. oh that's not exactly what i was referring to <laughs> uh, interesting interesting um so june of 1906 roosevelt directly directs the u.s attorney like he calls like in a secret nighttime meeting he calls the the u.s attorney general into his office and he's like i'm directing you to open a federal antitrust investigation into standard oil and then on november 18th 1906 that suit is filed in missouri suit again federal suit federal antitrust suit against standard oil on the grounds you know what the grounds are they have violated the sherman antitrust act (laughs) they are in restraint of trade which is really interesting because (laughs) it was definitely true in 1890 it was true through the 1890s but their dominance was fading at this point in like the late 19 aughts you were already getting into a situation where there was major foreign influence. I mean, there was lots of oil found in in Russia and in the Middle East. You're starting to get discoveries in Texas. Yep. California. And who, who was it that said that uh, if there was oil found west of the Mississippi, they would drink all of it? Oh, I, uh, I, I haven't heard that one. There was some standard oil crony at one point that was so confident that there was no oil west of the Mississippi that they would drink it uh. if anybody <laughs> found any. And like, so standard oil strong suit was not Texas. And of course, the Permian Basin would become where tons of oil ended up being found. Yeah. Tex- uh, Texaco, uh, or what became Texaco and Gulf, I think also yep. came out of Texas. Yep. 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 Uh, so there, there were, yeah, the monopoly was fading anyway, which probably was the other factor that made like, there are three things. One, Roosevelt bought the son of a bitch, but he didn't stay bought. <laughs> uh, two, uh, Tarbell, uh, and the muckrakers in public opinion. And three, like legitimately, they weren't that, you know, they're still the most powerful company in the world but they weren't as powerful well yeah Mar- like so so i don't want to flash forward too far here but i do know that in 1911 when the federal antitrust law when things go down <laughs> when things go down which I'll, I'll just leave there for a second their market share had eroded to 64 percent. there were at least 147 other refining companies competing with it in the united states at that point john d had left the company and so you you do have this really interesting sort of scenario where, like, I don't know, did it need to be broken up at that point? Are we are we chasing demons of twenty years earlier? I think we'll hold on that for now. But I think that's the that's the thing to sort of noodle on at this point. Yeah. Well, we'll hold on it just for a minute. Let's let's go there. Let's you know, not <laughs> a bunch of like crazy drama happens between nineteen oh six and nineteen eleven, but it's all it's all a sideshow. Uh, it just takes that long for all this to get to the Supreme Court. Um, and then Judgment Day, May 15th, 1911, U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice Edward White reads the decision. And this is like Standard Oil v. United States, right? Yes. Like it's like this is the big one. Yeah. And and Standard in the, oh gosh, what's the circuit below the Supreme Court? Federal Court of Appeals, maybe some appellate court. I'm not sure. Uh, I should know this as child of two lawyers, and my two Jenny's two parents are also lawyers. They'll be yelling at me listening to this. Uh, <laughs> anyway, Standard had lost. Standard lost every step of the way, and then the final appeal, of course, is to the Supreme Court. Uh, Supreme Court upholds the decision of uh, finding against Standard Oil. They are indeed in restraint of trade. Uh, and orders them, 
uh, I, I don't know if it was the Supreme Court that ordered this remedy or if this was what had been ordered at the lower courts and they upheld it uh, to be irrevocably cannot undo this broken up into 34 separate companies and it has to happen within the next six months it's a fast time frame to be able to disassemble a company seriously especially because all of the you know previous um changes in corporate structure at standard oil uh, may or may not have actually happened like they said it happened but like did it really happen but this no like they got to do this this time there's some tech debt there's some legal debt to go and uh, undo here did you read about Rockefeller's reaction when he gets the news? Is this when he's on the golf course and a messenger just brings it on like a little piece of paper? So free. this is the best. This is the best. Uh, <laughs> Real quick, before we get to that, I want to thank PitchBook, our second sponsor for this episode and all episodes in season nine. Speaking of bringing data uh, on the golf course, you can access PitchBook on the golf course. On your mobile phone. They've got this great app. Really anywhere that you need private or public company data it's right there in your in your hands in your pocket on our tear sheet that we've been uh, referencing this episode pitchbook was kind enough to prepare some great stats for us about the company um, most of you know this but they're the leading financial data provider for vc private equity m a they've got over three million companies they've got a million and a half deals on that 96 percent of clients rate them better than any other data provider for private company coverage Uh, obviously we use it for the show. We've got a very special offer for you today and all other days that you are listening to this, at least before the end of this season. I assume that it it expires at some point. Uh, But if you go to pitchbook.com slash acquired, you can get limited access for two weeks to all of this data. So if you're about to do a fundraise for your company or maybe you're um, you know, a, an, an investor and you're interested in, in, you know, checking out a market landscape on uh, some companies you're thinking about investing in, something like that, go check it out, pitchbook.com slash acquired. And our thanks to the wonderful people that we get to work with at PitchBook. They're seriously awesome. They're the best. They are. Okay, so take us back to the golf course, David. So Rockefeller, he, he had come out of hiding at this point. <laughs> One of the crazy things that happened in the interim between 1906 and 1911 was um, <laughs> Roosevelt got really pissed about this. There was a judge in Chicago um, that almost blew up the whole case. He he subpoenaed Rockefeller and was willing to, because uh, he wanted him to come you know, testify and was willing to grant him criminal immunity uh if he came to testify so rockefeller was like i'll take that i'll take that deal <laughs> oh and he couldn't be like tried again for double jeopardy then so this would have been the one he couldn't be criminally prosecuted huh. after this huh sidebar what happened this is ridiculous what happened so he comes he, he does the whole doddering old man thing again i don't oh, know i've lost don't my don't way why, what who are you uh <laughs> what's oil what's oil uh <laughs> the, the judge gets nothing out of him but he's so pissed at the end of the process, I forget what the exact case was. He levies a twenty-nine million dollar fine on Standard Oil, uh, which is like by like an order, like two orders of magnitude, the highest fine ever given to a company ever at this point. That's crazy. Yeah, that's like is that, is that over a billion dollars today? I don't know. It was a lot of freaking money. Uh, I mean, now like companies get fined all the time, but this was. I think it was one, if not two orders of magnitude higher of an intervention than the government had ever done in private enterprise before. So what does this do? This sends the stock market plummeting uh, because everybody's like, oh, crap, the government's going to start coming after all of these companies. And they already knew the government wanted to, but this is the first time it was like, oh, crap, this has teeth. Uh, And so there's a panic in the stock market. Oh, does Rockefeller buy? Rockefeller... (laughs) <laughs> Rockefeller, not you know, he buys the dip, quote unquote. That'd be the the easy joke to make here. But even more, he bail he offers to bail out the freaking country. So he rolls. Everybody's like, because now he's come out of hiding. Oh, is this the Panic of eighteen ninety three? This was in like nineteen, gosh, I don't know, eight nineteen oh nine, sometime around then, sometime between six and eleven. Got it. But there's a huge panic, and. uh everybody's pressuring him like hey you're the wealthiest man in america you know say something but like when you know when there's a panic now and buffett comes out and reassures everybody never bet against america yeah it's never bet against america rockefeller does buffett one better he comes out and he's like 
I'll backstop everything <laughs> personally. <laughs> uh, so he like averts, you know, he restores confidence in everybody. Just a great irony here. <laughs> that was like, that's the best sideshow of this whole thing. So at this point, he can't be tried uh, criminally. Yeah, he's going to get off scot-free for the rest of his life. And he's no longer, I think by 1911, he actually had left Standard Oil. Well, so when the breakup happens in December, then he officially, his resignation is in for, is, is accepted at that point in time. And then he rides off into the sunset. The great thing, we'll talk about this in a sec. He just becomes this like, like the happiest man on earth after this. <laughs> he's so happy. He's golfing. He's vacationing. He's becoming more of a socialite. All of his worries about philanthropy, that albatross is off his shoulders. He's created this institution. He's done these great things for the world doesn't have to worry about standard oil first literally he's got to get out of jail card free for the rest of his life <laughs> so messenger comes he's on the golf course on uh on the fateful may 15th 1911 not a care in the world he's golfing actually with the local catholic priest in uh, in tarrytown <laughs> uh they were they were buds he loved this like private golf course that he owned because he could take people out and like restrict them from ever talking business and so he got to be like jovial and social exactly on his terms yeah like he doesn't talk business anymore he just like after after he gets the get out of jail free card literally he's the happiest man in the world <laughs> <laughs> so they're on the golf course he gets the messenger running up oh, the supreme court ruled against standard oil it's gonna be broken up <laughs> this is how the legend goes he gets the news. He turns to the priest smiling and he says, Father Lennon, his name was Lennon, um, have you some money? And everybody in the golfing party is like, uh, geez, John, I mean, I know this is bad that standards going to get broken up, but you're not going to be bankrupt. Like you don't need, you don't need the Catholic priest here in Terry. To, you got some real estate assets at least that you can sell off and like, uh, you know, support yourself in your old age here. So he's like, what, uh, you know, Father Lennon's like, uh, uh, well, what, why do you ask, John? <laughs> and Rockefeller says, because if you did, you should buy some Standard Oil stock right now. <laughs> 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 and he's so right. This is the great irony. This is the best, best thing that ever happened to Standard Oil's share price. To well, not, not at that exact moment. Of course, at that exact moment, the share price went tumbling. Uh, but in the long run, uh, to Rockefeller, you know, the whole, the, the line, and it's true is that he made more money in retirement and after standard oil was broken up than he did while he was working. So what happens, uh, and, and turnout turn writes here, this was literally the luckiest stroke of Rockefeller's career precisely because he lost the antitrust suit. Rockefeller was converted from a mere millionaire with an estimated worth of net worth of 300 million in 1911 into something just short of history's first billionaire so remember he owned a quarter of the company trust you know whatever the thing and he basically never sold shares he was always a buyer from other people anytime he had a dispute with a partner or another board member i'll buy you out and because his mafia cronies uh you know archbold and flagler i think flagler was gone at this point but you know all the like they kept raising the dividend against his wishes he was just getting this geyser of cash every year and that was financing all the philanthropy and whatnot so yeah he wasn't selling he still owns a quarter of this dang thing uh when the breakup happens uh shares so it's broken up into 34 companies standard oil of new jersey the main one but then all the other you know operations in the various states and refining and whatnot are separated out and when they get separated out i'm pretty sure they become publicly traded companies and so the financials, the books get opened and people can see what ludicrously good businesses these are. Well, so yes, you can see what ludicrously, you know, the, the, the financials, but also not just the financials, the assets. They own all sorts of crap in these things. It's not just like the oil offer. They own God knows what and everybody, they, all these like secret assets and all these, you know, competitors and operations and upstream and downstream stuff that you know, people thought were competitors, but really weren't. Forests to build barrels and what did, everything we talked about in, in the first one. Railroad cars, all this stuff. Ability to make take metals and turn them into pipes and plumbing operations. And it's crazy. Yep. So uh, December 1st, 1911, the breakup 
takes effect. 34 companies, they all get publicly listed. I don't know if it was on the New York Stock Exchange or whatever, but on, on a stock exchange, you know, for the first time. Uh, I don't think immediately, but over the next year, uh, <laughs> Standard Oil of New Jersey goes from an initial share price of $360 a share to $595 a share over year, year one. Uh, Standard Oil of New York goes from $260 to $580. Standard Oil of Indiana goes from thirty five hundred to ninety five hundred uh, a share, and so on and so on. Whoa, close to tripling! Yeah, all of these companies, <laughs> literally newspapers across America, because I mean, this is like this is just selling papers here. All this news, they start running daily box scores. I don't know if it was alongside the sports section or whatnot, keeping track of Rockefeller's net worth, <laughs> uh, and um, it's. Uh, it's amazing. So yeah, I, I hope that uh, I hope that that uh, that Catholic priest had some some money to go buy, invested by the dip. I love that. That's the stock tip too. He's like, all right, everyone's about to know what a great business this is. <laughs> oh, Jesus says, buy the dip. Uh, <laughs> uh, and another one of the just amazing things here. Um, so of course, you know, we finally have to separate out these assets. You know, everybody on the executive committee that met for lunch every day. You know, the famous thing that we're titularly the presidents of all the separate companies now they actually are so they can't meet for lunch anymore gotta separate out no more lunch meetings at 26 broadway instead at jd's suggestion you know sort of like voice from from the golf course he's like how about y'all meet for coffee at 10 30 instead so they continue meeting every day at ten thirty. Just giving the finger to the government. It's like the old line about you know when a when a European you know monarch dies and and they say you know the king is dead, long live the king, or the you know, the monarch is dead, long live the monarch. Standard Oil is dead, long live Standard Oil. <laughs> that is exactly what happens here. And so it's interesting in thinking about why, at least in theory, why the government wanted to break up Standard Oil. It wasn't that they wanted to necessarily, again, in theory, punish the owners of Standard Oil because that they wildly failed at. It was literally like, we want to increase competition and and theoretically, it will benefit consumers. But again, I really want to underscore that for the vast majority of cases, and let's take out the like weird supermarket stuff they were doing and some of the terrible things they were doing at the railroads, like it really all was just a benefit to consumers. Yep. So you ended up with like consumers generally pretty happy from all this standardization over the years, competitors super pissed, and now the shareholders of Standard are all just wildly rich beyond their wildest dreams. It's actually quite interesting to think about the people that like took the deal in the Cleveland Massacre. If they had held, like that would have gone really well for them. So Chief Justice Edward White, uh, who, you know, presided over the verdict and you know, read the decision. He was actually like a very conservative figure and very business friendly. Um, so he had actually been, he had had this sort of pet theory and this was a chance to like write this into law. Oh gosh, I'm going to blank on what, what the term of it was. But, you know, remember there was the, the modifying clause on the Sherman antitrust act was uh, in restraint of trade. Uh, and it's like, what is that? Oh, so this was an ability to define what restraint of trade is. And I think his whole thing was like, I think it was called like the reasonableness doctrine or the re reason, something like that, um, that uh, he wanted to be like, yeah, in restraint of trade within reason. And this is what you're talking about here. It's like, well, let's be reasonable about this. Like, it's not actually that bad for customers. Yeah so interesting and roosevelt was pissed about this because he wasn't the president anymore by the time this happened uh roosevelt and like tarbell and the muckraking crew and all the you know progressives they really like they wanted all the standard oil people to go to jail they wanted to throw the book they wanted to end this practice forever and of course that's not what happened and they wanted to make it so other people were afraid enough that they would never try it again in the future yep and it ended up being this like you know very middle not even middle ground, like very business friendly, you know, sort of quote unquote conservative uh, final approach to it. The government had a really big investment in this where we talked about how Standard Oil is really the, the, the first modern corporation. Roosevelt sort of set the playbook for the modern billionaire. We talked about how he invented modern philanthropy. This is also 
like massively expanding the uh, might of the Justice Department in a way that the U.S. had never seen before. Because in the 1890s, the entire Justice Department staff in Washington was 18 lawyers. Oh, yeah, I remember reading about this. In order to go after Standard Oil, they massively, massively staffed up. And I, I assume it just never went down from there. So there is another reason, too, why the breakup um, ended up being great for Standard Oil and for its shareholders. And, and probably, to, you know, I don't think the government was thinking about this probably at all as a, um, as a uh, consequence of the breakup. But I, I think does speak to, there's like a really important lesson here about the danger of too much um, centralization and like uh, consolidation of power in a single entity. And that is that, so, you know, we've, we've alluded all along to the fact that, um, it was automobile sales and the going from kerosene to gasoline that was really going to take Standard Oil and the whole energy industry, you know, t- to the moon, to the next level here. Um, it, that's not what Rockefeller and the cronies and all the people that were having lunch at 26 Broadway or coffee. That's not what they were built for. They were that was like, you know, they weren't against it, but that wasn't their that wasn't their game. And as long as they were in charge and as long as Standard Oil was this singular monolithic, you know, in practice uh, thing, um, a lot of the sort of young Turks uh, within the organization that were focused on this new market felt stifled. So the breakup allowed these people, the, the new blood, to rise to the top. So Chernow writes, while the old guard at 26 Broadway mourned the trust's passage, some young Turks at the operating companies were overjoyed. One of these extraordinary mavericks, Dr. William M. Burton of Standard Oil of Indiana, thought that Roosevelt had performed an inestimable service. After the 1911 dismemberment, he said, it was felt all along the line younger men were given a chance. Burton patented an exceptionally valuable process in 1913, two years later, for quote-unquote cracking crude oil, that is, for refining it so as to yield a far higher percentage of gasoline. This discovery permitted Standard of Indiana to reap incredible windfall royalties. And, you know, if you remember from we were looking up on the last episode, what did Standard of Indiana become? Amico. Amico. (laughs) Uh, And it was all this, like all these, you know, innovation was was alive and well again within the oil industry here and within all the standard sort of children um so you know that's what standard oil of indiana becomes amico yeah do, can, can i talk about Should the we go through? yeah let's yeah. talk about them all right so the the spin outs uh, of the 34 many of them you know you, you'll you'll know <laughs> to, to say the least so the first especially one, if you grew up in america but even if you didn't like you'll know yeah yeah the first one was Standard Oil of New Jersey, but its name in the spin-out was not Standard Oil of New Jersey. It was the Eastern Seaboard Standard Oil, or the acronym <laughs> ESSO, E-S-S-O, this which is, so is a great. little cute wink-wink, nudge-nudge by Rockefeller and crew to say, and we're still S-O. I just love these, our anti-heroes here. Like, they're just <laughs> such characters. Like, uh, totally. The... Um, the whole thing reminded me, uh, I think this was when I was growing up, maybe you two, um, the SO, ESSO, which I had no idea what that referred to until recently. Um, the marketing slogan was, uh, put a tiger in your tank. Do you remember that? Oh, no. Yeah, it was so good. Uh, <laughs> and literally, I mean, like <laughs> this, this breakup and allowing these companies to flourish puts a tiger in everybody's tank here. Yeah, so ESSO becomes Exxon. Yep. Standard Oil of New York becomes Mobile. Yep. Standard Oil of Indiana, as we mentioned, becomes Amoco. Standard Oil of California becomes Chevron. Boom. Standard Oil of Ohio, which became Sohio, then got bought by BP to become BP America. The Ohio them. Oil Company, which became Marathon, and then also the Speedway brand. Ooh. 
The Atlantic Refining Company, which got shortened to ARCO, Arco. <laughs> uh, part of that was spun off and bought by Sunoco, and then the rest of it was acquired by BP, and then ironically, they sold that brand over to Marathon. Uh, so a lot of internal dealings here still. Continental Oil became Conoco, which of course is now Conoco Phillips, and the South Penn Oil Company became Pennzoil. Oh, I didn't know that one. I missed that one. Ah, oh, that's cool. Because yeah, there were all these other oil products that they were developing and marketing. Yep. Man, I didn't know Pennzoil was a standard oil uh, uh, child. And here's the craziest thing is if you trace it all the way back and you look at the Standard Oil of New Jersey and Standard Oil of New York, Exxon and Mobil together accounted for more than half of the whole Standard Oil business prior to 1911. So Exxon Mobil really is the like primary reconglomeration of the majority of the original Standard Oil. Yeah. So fascinating. So fascinating. And there's almost like an evil laugh that I want to <laughs> that I want to have after that line because it's it is you're right it's like it's like delicious and it's it's a, a a century in the making. Yeah. Well, in a sec here, we're gonna like should it be an evil laugh or like a, a, a we'll debate in a second. All right, let's put a bow on uh, on this whole thing, shall we? I want to end with just like illustrating standards wealth here because, uh, uh, or, or in more, more in particular Rockefeller's wealth, because we've talked about a few figures over time. One of them was the 1902 audit that showed he was worth about 200 million. Then around 1911, the around 300 million. Well, he actually, with all the stock pops in the split up and the, uh, move into the gasoline market for internal combustion engines, his personal wealth by 1913, just two years after the breakup, was $900 million. So in 2021, inflation-adjusted dollars, if you literally just do the inflation math, that's about $25 billion. But the more accurate way to look at it would be to say, actually, that's like 3% of GDP, which was still only $40 billion relative, of course, to $21 trillion today. So <laughs> if you if you base it on GDP, that figure is about four hundred and seventy billion dollars. Uh, yeah, that's because I the figures I had in my mind and that I think are on Wikipedia are in that sort of three hundred to five hundred billion adjusted net worth range. Yeah. So like I, I do think we should think about him like he was a four hundred and seventy billionaire not in terms of purchasing capacity, but in in terms of societal impact. Like the 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 analogy doesn't scale all the way back. Like if you think about when the GDP of America was a thousand dollars, if someone had five hundred of that, like sure they controlled half the wealth half the wealth in the nation, but they didn't have the purchasing power that someone who would have uh, you know, ten trillion dollars today would have. So it's an imperfect way of scaling it. But, you know, there is no one who controls two to three percent of the nation's GDP in their pockets the way that that Rockefeller did in 1913. So let's think of him like a 470 billionaire. Well, and here's the thing: he had already given away about half of his wealth at that point. Yes, that's the nutty thing: is you already had the RMIR that there. You already had the 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 what would become Rockefeller University. You already had the University of Chicago. You already had all these medical endowments. It's wild. And so you you look today like Bezos and Musk are about 190 200 billion. You've got Gates at 130 billion again from all the philanthropy. About tied with Zuckerberg. Uh, Buffett these days has about 100 billion again from the philanthropy. So it, like. If you think that Rockefeller, he sort of had the potential to have like seven, eight hundred billion in terms of the amount of of sort of influence of the nation's wealth that he controlled, which probably would be about all of the other moguls today combined, right? That is exactly where I'm going. Perfect. Well, and that's the perfect analogy. He kind of was that. I mean, yes, there was Carnegie, there was uh, J.P. Morgan, there was a generation earlier, there was Vanderbilt, you know, and and there was Stanford out in the West and like all that. Yep, yeah, for sure. Uh, but, uh, but this, the scale, like, yeah, nobody could touch Rockefeller. So we should transition into, uh, sort of the family generational wealth from here. Cause there's a few interesting things about it. So by the time of his death in 1937, 
Uh, his remaining fortune, of course, which is largely tied up in various family trusts, was estimated to be about $1.4 uh, $1 in 1937 dollars. So that's about 1.5% of GDP. It's about $315 billion of today's dollars. The Rockefeller family uh, is now seven generations in. Uh, there's about 170 heirs. According to Forbes, they have a, a fortune of about $11 billion in 2016. So obviously been doing a tremendous amount of philanthropy. I do think that $11 billion, it's kind of an unknown. We can estimate it all we want, but like there are multiple Rockefeller family trusts and philanthropies and wealth management groups. And, you know, it's a maze. There is literally a business and a business ecosystem around the Rockefeller <laughs> family. Uh, which is crazy. I actually went to college with several of them. Rock Co. is a like a, a wealth management firm for the Rockefeller family. Venrock, the venture capital firm. Yes. Okay. So this is what I wanted to talk about. So obviously, The Rock is Rockefeller. And for those not familiar who want a crazy tie from this episode to modern day, Venrock was one of the earliest investors in none other than Apple Computer. That's right. That's right. It was. Just amazing how full circle this comes alongside arthur rock yep yep so this really bucks the trend of have you ever heard the phrase david shirts shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations mm. uh i didn't i didn't know the three generations part but i've heard shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves yeah it's like the general idea that because of taxes and you know the fact that this is when you have heirs and they have heirs and they have heirs this is a exponential distribution of wealth so it just everything keeps getting cut in smaller and smaller pieces pretty quickly that has not, not to mention been also, the case yeah there's not been the case but i think the other thing obviously not in every case but it's pretty hard hard quote unquote, nobody would shed any tears but you know maybe you should like uh it's a hard psychological um set of cards to be dealt where you're like you are born into a family it's that boo who trust fund of right, multi billion, but, but, but like still, it, like how do it you, wreaks it, havoc on people's psychology. Totally, how do you like, go live a regular life when you yep. know you have that in the bank? Totally. So I, I just find it fascinating how like this the shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves thing hasn't really been true. Neither has the like. There's been no real like major lawsuits that we know of, or feuds, or public scandals. Like they're out of the news. It's this family with 170 heirs that still you know, wields billions and billions, tens of billions of dollars at the very least, um, is involved in all these projects and you really never hear about them. Yeah. You know, again, because like when we were talking about the philanthropy, like Rockefeller didn't want his name on stuff. So, you know, all these universities, all this stuff, you know, you don't know that it's Rockefeller money, but then there's the one great exception of Rockefeller Center. <laughs> yeah. So I got the list. You ready? Yep. So this is like, I, this is what I spent my last hour doing before we recorded. So we talked about Spelman College. We talked about the University of Chicago. We talked about Rockefeller University and all the unbelievable medical breakthroughs. We talked about the grant that he made to Johns Hopkins that ended up funding the discovery of a cure for scarlet fever, which is pretty cool. From And then, so here's, this continues. From 1915 to 1940, Junior financed, designed, and directed the construction of a network of carriage roads through Acadia National Park and then refinanced the whole restoration of the park in 1947. So it's this really interesting thing where Junior, whereas Senior kind of left his mark in medical research, like he decided that that was something that he could do that was, you know, not necessarily religious, but moral. And so it aligned well with his religious views and the stamp that he wanted to put on the world. In fact, Carnegie, he was, Rockefeller was so well known for being the medical donor that like when Carnegie got approached with projects like this, he would go, I do believe you're looking for Mr. Rockefeller. So like that was, Rockefeller put his stamp there. Junior was a, a, a naturalist. Like he really, you know, wanted to, to endow parks and things like that. So check this out. Junior was a huge part of the donation to restore and recreate Colonial Williamsburg. Yes. For anybody that's been there. Yep. That was the main uh, funding of Colonial, yes. the recreation of Colonial Williamsburg. Yep. Congress in uh, 1926 authorized the creation of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, but there was no nucleus of federally owned land or, to actually develop it. So Junior contributed $5 million in 1926 dollars. The U.S. government then kicked in $2 million 
and private citizens from Tennessee and North Carolina pitched in to assemble the land for the park piece by piece. Then... Junior led the round the government participated in, basically. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Then you've got Abby Aldrich Rockefeller, who I believe is she uh, Junior's, Junior's wife. wife. Junior's yeah. wife, yeah. She... Oh, the, you're going to say Talk about what I think you're going to talk about here? The MoMA. The MoMA. The Museum of Modern Art in New York City was her brainchild. Which... The, the the land that the mom was on the the building yeah. the space those were the those were the two those were the first Rockefeller mansions in New York oh uh, the, no way the, not the I think they tore down the buildings and the the MoMA is a new building there but that land was when the family first moved from Cleveland to New York they they built two they they bought two mansions next door to each other one for senior and one for junior uh right there and that land I think wow. is now the MoMA. Wild. Well, and then nearby there, there's obviously Rockefeller Center, which yep. was a, a junior project. Uh, Rockefeller Center is fascinating, right? Because it wasn't, it was a business project. It was Junior's yeah. like main business project. And everybody thought he was crazy. Like who would want to be headquartered? Then he recruited GE uh, to be GE an anchor tenant. And RKO, like in the Radio City Music Hall. The reason it's called Radio City is he recruited all the like radio, like the media organizations to come headquarter there. Uh, and um, now not yeah, to mention NBC. Yep. Yep. You know, 30 rock, like rock, 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 Valley center, the, <laughs> uh, the ice skating rink senior sure. loved ice skating. Oh yeah. That uh, was his winter thing instead of golf. Yeah. And so I think ice skating even started earlier in his life. I think it did. It did. Yeah. Back in, back in Ohio. Cause um, he was like a big fitness buff, but yep. interestingly not for, um, vanity purposes for longevity purposes because he was very much like a he wanted to live to be 100 he came close at 98 but he was you know very to put it exactly the way that i think he thought about it afraid of dying and so anything that was for health and longevity was sort of virtuous to him hbo and the uh silicon valley writers team could have a field day with rockefeller <laughs> if they were to go do like a retro version of silicon valley all right so the the party continues in 1945 junior donated eight and a half million dollars which i think is something on the order of 100 million today to just go buy the land for the un like this is you know right after world war ii that would become the the where they built the un building in new york that's awesome and just donated it he continues, the area that is now Grand Teton National Park was privately owned until the 1930s when Junior started buying up the land that would eventually, uh, he would donate to become much of the park, especially the actual Jackson Hole area. I really could go on too with like large areas of the Redwood State Park in California or Embarcadero Center, like the, the buildings in San Francisco. No way. Yeah, uh. yeah. Again, more of a business project, less of a philanthropy necessarily, but that is a that 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 was a Rockefeller investment. It's just amazing. Like the <laughs> this family, uh, you know, this man like and the company and company and then companies, the foundation the institutions you know and then the family that he begat like like every aspect of like american life was touched uh and modernized like by the rockefellers it's insane yeah you're playing right into my what i try to say at the top of the show and what i was alluding to when uh our world is a rockefeller shaped one and in more ways than just standard oil <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, there's definitely some playbook and other things that I want to talk about here. But first, let's talk about power. So we reviewed, I, I think we probably did the seven powers justice in part one, and we don't need to do it again. But I do want to make a, a point, especially because we sort of teased it in the intro of where did they have legitimate pre business practices and where did they kind of run afoul, where the initial power that they had in the business really came from like their operating excellence, uh, creating economies of scale, innovating, like clever production inventions and in, in refining. But then later on, they clearly leveraged their scale position to like put competitors out of business, screw over partners like the railroad, yep. uh, try and gobble up as much of the value chain in really sort of nefarious ways. Um, and eventually, they just straight up used racketeering and bribery to <laughs> to to sort of ensure that their um their very profitable business at 90% market share could continue. 
one one fun little sidebar that I uh, I missed in the notes on that um, <laughs> literally was straight up bribery. You know, I think we've only talked about political campaign donations. <laughs> Archbold, Archbold was he was like he was really somebody. Uh, he when he took over, he actually put legislators on the payroll like not campaign donations just like <laughs> you you get fifteen thousand dollars a year you you get twenty thousand dollars a year like to do what we want <laughs> in perpetuity i think the best way to put it is probably they became unsatisfied with what they had accomplished and they just kept pushing yep it's almost like i i do wonder this is probably the the right transition point to what would have happened otherwise. I mean, what if the trust hadn't gotten broken up? And I think we should examine it from Standard Oil shareholders' perspective, which I think we're all going to say, like, what well, would have been worse? Uh, consumers' perspective and then competitors' perspective. And and in part, like maybe even before what would have happened if they hadn't been broken up, maybe we should examine what would have happened if they hadn't gone into nefarious business practices. Like what what if they just were the leading innovator and they had the best operational excellence and they were operating at large scale so they could have legal scale dynamics out at play? Yeah. You know, it's funny. My my thoughts on this I think there was like, it's like a, I don't know, we were talking about boiling points earlier in the episode. I think up until a certain point, as we hopefully laid out in part one, what they were doing was, um, I don't, I don't want to bring morals into it, but it was a chaotic point in both American history and in the industry. Like it was chaos uh, in the oil industry in the early days. And kind of you know is rockefeller's argument right like we would have all beat each other to death uh and maybe somebody maybe we would have emerged the winner eventually but we accelerate it's like um uh foundation you know for people who've read uh uh asimov's foundation right like the the whole premise is there will be like chaos for fifty thousand years or one thousand years if we have the selden plan to like get everybody through to the other side and it'll happen much faster and suffering will be alleviated. That's what standard oil did in the early days. I think I would say that there is a lot of merit to that, but once that happened, then they kept, especially after, after Rockefeller left, you know, Archbold and the other cronies, they kept using those tactics even after they'd already crossed the point. And that was bad. They were insatiable. It was like all the, even, even some of the more nefarious tactics, you're right, probably led to, good things for everyone, especially for the the people who did end up taking standard oil shares rather than being run out of business. But then at some point, it doesn't accrue benefit to anyone in the ecosystem so to, to keep pressing your advantage. And the damning piece of evidence here, uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it's in Titan that turn now quotes. It's actually just a small part of the book. I wish he'd spent more time on it. <laughs> at a certain point, you know, just like Uber and you know Lyft today are like you know the all monopoly or duopoly type businesses. At a certain point, they did start raising prices on consumers. Uh, and in those early days, you know, it was great for consumers. They kept prices artificially low, et cetera, et cetera. But once they did wipe out all the competition, and Rockefeller was against this, but the cronies started doing it. Uh, they started raising prices and exploiting monopolistic pricing power. Um, so, you know, at a certain point, I think it did become at least not as good for consumers. Consumer harmful. Yeah. 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 Okay. So what if the trust wasn't broken up? Yeah, they probably would have. It would have eventually become worse for consumers. Uh, it, it certainly. Well, the competitors thing is interesting. So we've already talked about shareholders. It was great for com for shareholders that they got broken up. For competitors, it's interesting to me that there was already a very legitimate competitive set emerging by 1906, and certainly by 1911 when they only they had less than two thirds market share at that point. Yep. I don't think competitors were having a hard time at this point in history because of the maturation of discovery and drilling technology that we realized there was just way more oil out there than we realized. Like you drill into the Earth's crust at under 
most countries in the world and you're going to find some oil. And I think that would have eventually driven down their market share even if the uh, government hadn't broken them up into 34 constituent parts. So we thought, uh, we were debating like, how do we grade this? What what analysis do we do? You know, we, we, we talked a little bit about powers here, but we mostly covered that in the last episode. Um, you know, we're going to end with a grade here uh, in, in a minute, but we want to add a special section for this episode, which is uh, one of our motivations for doing this series, other than like, it's a really freaking great story and we love telling good stories. Uh, it's like, duh, this is happening again now, you know, with tech. <laughs> Or let's at least say it's happening in social networking, where they're being rolled up together. It's happening in... Actually, that's the chief offender. Well, and Amazon, too, and e-commerce. like there's... Yeah, but not in this like rolling up way. Like if Facebook is the most direct, comparable thing to Standard Oil. Like, Apple has plenty of offenses in potentially abusing their App Store privilege, uh, but I think that's a little bit of a different thing. Yeah, certainly on the... Um antitrust sentiment in the public though uh i think that expands to all of big tech right now in the government and in the public uh not just social networking yep somehow not microsoft this time around but yeah uh, yeah right they already had their their day in court um but yeah sorry we thought this was a really apt thing to do right now uh and uh so we thought for this section we would uh kind of just brainstorm and go through and catalog like all right what are the similarities and differences let's enumerate them between the standard oil story and the situation with big tech today. Um, and this is the one I hadn't thought about this before we recorded, but as you were saying, uh, the market had already started to change by the time the breakup happened and the competitors were emerging in a way that nobody thought they could before. And that was because of market conditions. I think that's happening now too. Are you saying that that the Calibra is not going to win Web3? <laughs> I doubt it. Uh, I seriously doubt it. But yeah, like if we rewind two to three years ago, um, and I, I even think like talk, talking to LPs about uh, venture capital fundraising two to three years ago is where this, this was like really acute. There were conversations happening where a legitimate concern was like, why should we invest in startups right now? Because big tech is settled. Big tech. Well, and they're going to eat everything, you know, but so between Facebook and Amazon and Google and Apple and all the returns are accruing to scale in a way that's never happened in this industry before. And it's just going to happen indefinitely. Any new market or idea of any import that comes along, the best you're going to be able to hope for is that Facebook buys you for a couple billion dollars. Um, like, uh, it seemed dire out there. <laughs> Fast forward to today, and like I don't know about you, Ben, but I am wildly excited about investing in startups and not in big tech companies. Oh, it feels like we're at the the same way that it was at the beginning of the mobile era. It feels like this explosion right now in in particularly Web three and a lot of you know crazy wrong stuff out there. But it, there's so much heat and energy, and it's such a new paradigm. Yep, and. I think not only it's not just crypto and Web three. Look at like SaaS company. Like how many independent, multi billion or tens of billions of dollars public SaaS companies are there out there now? Like Amplitude just went public. Totally. There's a new five to ten billion dollar IPO every other day right now. Like a few years ago, that would have been unimaginable. So true. And it's funny you said a few years ago uh, the Ben Thompson article, "The End of the Beginning," which lays out this hypothesis, uh, and he has some, a really good analysis on it. I think it's probably the best, um, the best analysis done on uh, are we done creating new big tech companies forever? Uh, that was January of 2020. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> oh, Hadn't wow. been that long. Oh, wow. All right, I think it's time. Is it? Is it? It might be time for another acquired postulate. I don't know what we're going to name this one. Ooh, lay it on me, and I'll decide. All right, All right. new postulate. Heard it here first. Probably, I'm, I'm sure we're not the first people to say this. Anytime somebody declares the end of something, uh, like you know, this game is over, this market is over, blah blah blah. <laughs> that They're is wrong. the that is the uh, 
bottom of the market and is all going up from there because it is never the end. What was the year that the uh, inspector general of the the USPTO said that everything's already been invented? Oh, I don't know that one. That's that's uh, like one of these best apocryphal quotes ever. So good. Yeah, that's that's a great. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. I mean, one. Let me make a more nuanced point. Uh, and I oh, sort of and just real quick, all those LPs in, uh, you know, twenty. Oh my God, I'm just thinking about this. I, I love LPs uh, as a class, but like 2016, 2017, 2018, when they were nervous and like worried about this and not wanting to invest in venture capital. Oh my God, those were the best years yeah. to be investing in venture capital. That's a great point. That's a great point. All right, go for well, it. Well, I want to make a little bit of an argument against regulation, uh, or at least the nervousness that regulation gives me. Regulation, by definition, will always limit innovation because it says you can do less stuff in the world. Yep. It's prescriptive. Yes. And a lot of times that's good. A lot of times that stuff shouldn't be done. Uh, People's creativity can lead them to do destructive things. But it does seem to be the case that paradigms break monopolies. And so we may not need legislation or the courts to do it. And that these things will play themselves out. Like, by the fact that 21 years after the Sherman Antitrust Act, Standard Oil's monopoly position was already unseated by the time the ruling came down. I mean, it's if, if there's so much value destruction going on by a monopoly that we can't afford to wait it out, that's, you know, that's one reasonable argument to either have law or courts change this. But paradigm shifts happen like new technologies happen and they will always unseat incumbents yep yep and in particular in this one it was the advent of electricity that unseated kerosene and the the uh creation of of the internal combustion engine and the massive desire for gasoline you know that sort of like undid (laughs) the the invention of electricity because suddenly there was this massive market available but then right around the same time again Oil's discovered freaking everywhere, and we can drill it very easily everywhere. So you sort of have this the, this massive destabilizing force driven by technology in our ability to go find this product elsewhere. Yep. I like that. So I guess where I'm going with that is um, it may not always be necessary to go trust bust as long as we're willing to sort of wait it out and if there's coincidental timing of a new technology sea change. Which I think is the argument that is at least so far kind of carried the day in terms of what's actually happened with big tech, at least in America, not in China, (laughs) but in America of, um, you know, gosh, these are like big hammers and you gotta be really careful about wielding them. Uh, and maybe it's better to let it play out a little longer before you, you know, bring the hammer down. Yeah. This is why I was saying that Facebook is the most similar thing to Standard Oil. And just to be extremely blunt about it, Facebook buying Instagram and WhatsApp is a lot like Standard Oil's Cleveland Massacre and, um, you know, the subsequent roll up of all these other refiners elsewhere. Oh, the parallels are like exact, right? Yeah. Like, like literally Zuck goes to went to these founders back in the day and was like, love what you're doing. Here's my competing product that I'm launching next week. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, here is the ultimatum. And I'm wondering if the internet and software makes it so that acquisition is not the only way, like growing horizontally via acquisition is not the only way to play Standard Oil's playbook. Like, should we be concerned about Apple or about Amazon's antitrusty stuff that might look like Standard Oil in a different way that is not rolling up? Mm-hmm. Those are more sort of like platform concerns, platforms either competing with the the vendors on them um, or perhaps uh, abusing their their position in the value chain to take too much of a rake, or as Bill Gurley would say, a rake too far, uh, uh, you know, obviously the 30% thing with Apple. Those, I think, are are different than what we're talking about here with Standard Oil. Well, if anything, I think Standard Oil actually was a... <laughs> I don't know what's better, what's worse, depends on your perspective. But to my perspective, played these aspects better because they could have done, they could have taken a rake too far on so many things. But as we talked about in the first episode, like they weren't, they didn't want to 
put all their partners out of business. They could have crushed the railroads under their foot at any time, but they didn't want to. They wanted them to profit and thrive. Ooh, maybe actually that's more like Apple, where like Apple's <laughs> keeping the take rate where it is. They're going to take an, an insane amount of the profits of the work of these partners but they want to keep the partners around. Like Apple's not going to, they're like, well, we don't want to go build every app. So it's good to have a developer ecosystem building apps. Whereas Standard Oil was like, yeah, I'm not sure we want to actually be the railroads, but it's really nice to extract as much value from them as we can. Yep. Well, and, oh, and I think that's where there's like a little there. Like, I don't know exactly. I don't recall or if you don't even, maybe, I don't know if I ever even knew the numbers well enough to say in terms of the relationships with the railroads. But I feel like, I don't know, Apple... Maybe this is just sentiment, but like, God, that 30% feels really unjustified. Whereas I don't think Standard with the railroads and their other partners wanted the partners to feel like they were doing taking an unjustified piece of the pie. Uh, they wanted them to know that they could at a moment's notice. <laughs> but uh, I think they really did value like warm relations, so to speak. Hmm. Interesting. All right, before we move on to a couple fun little last tidbits, I know you have been before we uh, before we grade. Uh, two more um, similarities I want to highlight uh, resonances between the, situ- the standard oil and the big tech situation. Um, one is like, I'm just struck by that quote about um, standard oil of Indiana at the end and like that the, the sort of young Turks in the ranks thought it was great when the breakup happened. And I think part of what was going on there is like the, the old guard became so ossified in their view of like how the world worked and like, weren't, (laughs) weren't seeing reality anymore, you know? And I think about not all the big tech companies, but again, to pick on Facebook, like this really seems to me on the outside to be the case with Facebook right now. And like the Facebook files and everything going on with the wall street journal, like, it really seems like leadership there. And again, whatever what's right or wrong, like they're like like when the um when the Tarbell articles came out and Rockefeller and everybody was like, oh, we don't need to say anything here. Like they're playing this wrong, you know. And I wonder. I bet there are a lot of people deep within the organization that are actually doing the work who are like, we should be have a different strategy here, but can't have their voices heard, you know. Um. Anyway. That's one. Um, the the other one, similarly, that I want to highlight is is like the press. You know, like this sort of like dual, the angelic and the sort of you know less angelic side of the press and people and journalists and their motivations. You know, this is playing out obviously real time in so many places in tech. Like, yes, the press is doing great, super valuable, incredibly important investigative work, and yes, they are also humans. And the New York Times hates Facebook. <laughs> yes. <laughs> They're also humans with agendas. Uh, uh, like that was true then and it's true now. At the end of the day, all of this is a bunch of humans doing things that they are incentivized to do for whatever biological, chemical reasons they're incentivized to do them. <laughs> yep. Yep. So the standard trademark was doled out as a part of the breakup to the 34 child companies, and each owns a different set of states that they can use it in. Many of these states have a use it or lose it clause in their trademark. And so in many of these states, including California, where Chevron owns the standard trademark, there is one or two gas stations that will carry the logo of the company you're familiar with, but say the word standard. And there's a great one in downtown San Francisco that you can go drive by and be like, wait, I'm sorry, what? Standard. It lives. It lives. It's it's at uh, Market and Van Ness, right? Yep. Yep. It's, uh, (laughs) you drive and you're like, whoa, that should be a Chevron station, but it says standard on it. So weird. So, so like such a fascinating, like, it's fun to like see a remnant of American history sort of like on, on your commute. Yep. Uh, the second one is a very interesting harbinger of what's to come. Uh, the foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation's assets, starting all the way back with Standard Oil and then, of course, in what it was broken up into, an enormous holding, as you can imagine is the oil companies, in particular, ExxonMobil. 
In December of 2020, just this last year, the foundation pledged to dump their fossil fuel holdings. Mm. So you have the, the original oil money pledging divestment. Yeah, interesting. So that'll be fascinating to watch how that plays out. So they haven't, is it that they've pledged to do it, but they haven't done it? I don't know it yet, what the time like, frame is yet. I assume yeah. they're not going to just dump all of it on Unload the market. Unload a bunch of Exxon on the market, like, yeah. yeah. Probably not. But to hear, you know, the, the John D's descendants pledging, you know, it's it's this uh, delicious dichotomy of of John D believing that we should hold on to the standard shares because they're going to be so valuable forever and hoard them. And now, you know, finally, we're at this moment in history where we're realizing how really terrible it is to burn all these fossil fuels. And even the largest holder of the remnant shares of the of the Standard Oil Company is now saying it is time for us to get rid of these. Yeah, it'd be super fun to find. Um, we we meant to do this on this episode, but it's there's too much other stuff to get in, and we're not experts. But maybe find some guests do a special episode on. Uh, like, I'd love to unpack this, right? Because like the the oil industry, you know, like oh, I would love yeah. to understand just current ownership structure. Like, who, yeah, you know, what well, what's the cap table look like? Totally. I, I mean, specifically, yes, all that too, but also from an environmental standpoint, like, yeah, fossil fuels are bad, but fossil fuels and oil upgraded the world technologically to where we are now, right. you know, like <laughs> quality of life, no doubt would not be what we have today if not for all the fossil fuels we burned. Right, right. So like, what is, I don't know, what's the right way to think about this? And we're not going to change overnight. That's the other thing. It's like, should yep. we all be using clean, safe nuclear? Yes, we should. And it's going to be a long time before that is the case. Yep. yep. So, well, more more fun acquired energy stuff to come in the future. Yep. Well, before we get to grading, we want to tell you about our last sponsor of this episode, NordVPN. I'm sure by now you know the story of a friend of the show, listener, Slack member, Tom Oakman, who started this company with his friends, his childhood friends in 2012. Now a thousand employees, 15 million people use it. It's the world's fastest VPN. I mean, the, the, the best way I can pitch this to you acquired listeners is if you're going to use a VPN, you should use this one. It's a great one. It's super fast and it's made by your fellow acquired listening compatriot. Awesome story of this being a, a bootstrapped company from Lithuania. Uh, just a, just an amazing entrepreneurial success. So our, our special thanks to Tom and the whole Nord team. You can sign up at nordvpn.com slash acquired and use the coupon code acquired at checkout. Also on VPNs like the, you know, as we've been, as Nord's been a sponsor this season, I've been thinking about it. Like VPNs are like totally nice and great to have. And I'm glad I have Nord here in the US. You can do, lets you do awesome stuff. Like if you wanted to maybe like, I don't know, watch a out of market streaming sports event when you're <laughs> when you're geographically in a city that you know you couldn't otherwise like cool that's awesome all sorts of great stuff there are also places in the world where vpns are like mission critical <laughs> critically important and like the difference between life and death like it's easy to forget that totally it is good stuff that they are doing all right grading um i thought a fun way to do this would be so the, the very classic acquired episodes, very early on especially, were grading and acquisition. So if you are the shareholder of a big company and you use some of the assets of that big company to buy the little company, how good of an investment or a use of those proceeds was it to go buy that, that little company? I thought for this one, it would be fun to say, well, I'm the shareholder or a shareholder of Standard Oil, and let's say the government's not involved, and I as the management team of the company are recommending that we break this up into 34 constituent parts. And like, we're not being forced to do anything. This is just the way that we are choosing to rearrange our corporate structure. Everyone's going to get a 34, uh, a share in 34 different companies proportional to your share of ownership in the standard oil company. And that is the transaction that, uh, that we are electing to make as a corporation. Are you saying it would be like, uh, I don't know if you're like a shareholder or a board director at Amazon and do I want to hold Amazon shares with everything or do I want AWS shares and 
Amazon shares. Exactly. Or SpaceX. And you're like, do I want to hold SpaceX shares and Starlink shares? Or even going back to our, our eBay episode with PayPal, like how good of an idea was it to do the spinoff for shareholder value? So I'm leading the witness here, but I, I don't think it's an A plus necessarily, but it's definitely an A that they, they did this it did from a pure shareholder value perspective in, uh, um, in finally being able to uh, open the books, see how good of a business each of these things were. And uh, the, the, there's an open question in my mind of like, what if you could just open the books of Standard Oil as a whole rather than break it into a bunch of little parts? But there is no arguing with it was a, a great move. Uh, again, I'll say it, and it sounds dirty saying it because it's just such a, a corporate um uh, capitalist phrase, but great move for shareholder value to um, break it up. Oh man, this was the this was the OG uh, you know value unlock. <laughs> <move>. <laughs> this is what you know investment bankers uh, uh, would be uh, uh, just salivating over uh, today. Oh, can you imagine the fees on this deal too? You can make so many slide decks. <laughs> Funny story. I was talking to uh, a, a friend earlier today. <laughs> He'll laugh when he when he listens to this. Uh, no identities or, or anything uh, uh, revealed here, but um, who was a investment banker back a few years ago? Uh, who uh, his his group covered Tesla, <laughs> and he was telling me about uh, the the four twenty day, the day that Elon tweeted oh. funding secured, and just the mass chaos that that unleashed on wall street because like oh they were like who's doing the deal if it's already secure well once everybody figured out like oh the deal was in flux but then like just the like the fee potential that like everybody's <laughs> eyes lit up to like we got to get in to be you know lead advisor on whatever this deal is going to be and signing up different buyers and partners and like <laughs> that, that this i can only imagine the situation if you were a banker and you heard that standard oil was considering a a spin out like it would have been <laughs> that times 10. Yeah. I mean, in, in reality, you actually had five years of preparation and lighting up the transaction to do. So it was probably a little bit more organized, but that, that actually wasn't covered much in, in Titan. So I'm curious for a more financial history of the breakup to, to cover. There's got to be like a um, barbarians at the gate of the standard oil breakup. Ooh, that would be so good. All right. So David, what's, what's your grade for you're a shareholder in standard oil? This is for sure an A. Like... On every dimension. I mean, we've we've already covered it. Like, there's no, <laughs> there's no dimension where this is bad. Uh, and it's, I don't know, it's probably borderline A plus. Like, I don't know. Like, this is a great for this type of transaction. I can't think of anything better. Like, this is this is great. The way that you could actually calculate some kind of return on it is like you look at the uh, appreciation and the ensuing decades of all the and compute some kind of IRR on all the component parts. Uh, and try and look at it versus the like previous 15 year IRR on the appreciation of the actual shares of standard. You get Archbold and Rogers and all that, all those guys out of there and turn this, these places into legitimate operations like us. Oh, it's, it's fantastic. Young Turks, gasoline centers. Yeah. All right. What, what do you think? I, I mean, that's, yeah, it's an A. I mean, I don't think anybody's going to uh, argue that like, uh, like these companies went on to become the most valuable companies in the world until big tech, you know? All right, so what does this portend for big tech breakups? To like, should Amazon spin out AWS? So I'm of the opinion that uh, it, it it's indifferent with Amazon. Like, I don't think that there's any value that's being like. First of all, we know the size of both businesses. Uh, I don't think the that it's them both being under one umbrella is creating drag for either one of the organizations. Like I think Amazon knows how to move pretty fast with both of them, but I also don't buy the like we're our own first and best customer thing in a way that is value creative on the scale of oh my god, they're so much better together than they would be apart. I think that's always been a myth that Amazon is the first and best customer of AWS. Like I don't think that's actually true well it took a while to move over all the amazon stuff that was written not on aws aws yeah, they were still using article until like last year yeah so i i actually think like uh, i uh, as a uh, potential amazon shareholder i don't know if we should disclose or can disclose on the show uh i i'm whether i hold it or not i'm indifferent to uh or as a theoretical amazon shareholder i'm indifferent <laughs> to uh 
you know, whether it's one company or two. I think we can. Well, at least I have before. I'm a <laughs> Amazon is a I saw a, a Uncle Stu uh Stuart in our uh, uh uh Slack community. He uh he tweeted today with uh like his current uh valuated uh holdings portfolio. So like all bets are off now. All bets are off now. We're we're in Stonkland. We're, exactly, we're in uncharted territory. Yeah. Amazon is uh I don't know if it's my biggest holding compared to big I think I think I have more Bitcoin than Amazon. But anyway, it's one of my top three for sure. Um Yeah, I, I think I'm with you indifferent to maybe slight preference for a spinoff. Um ah. I think it I think it would probably unlock Get a some standard oil in you value. Uh, but I'm probably this is probably just recency bias by just having done this episode here. Yep. Yep. All right, let's move on to carve outs. Yeah, let's do it. What do you got? All right, two for me. Uh the first one is uh the upcoming MacBook Pro with an M1X uh or an M2 or whatever. I so desperately need this that this I This is your like white whale. making it my carve out <laughs> just to will it into existence sooner. Uh, <laughs> I was looking around for like what should be my carve out and I I looked at my computer and I was like, well, not that thing. <laughs> you're going to uh, end up like never upgrading your oh computer because you're just holding out like I need I d- it I, so bad. I think I told you like a year ago that like you should have just gotten a Air. I I'm, I'm on the M1 Air. It's freaking fantastic and I then just sell it and book. get the Dude, you should just get an Air. You're right. If I'm willing to get a new and then iPhone, sell every it year, for you like will lose like ten bucks on it. These things keep their value so much. Like, <sighs> you're right. But we're so close now. All right. If they I, don't right? announce See, this why, damn thing, but I like, thought it was like three months away forever. Right. Right. I think if this is not out by December, I'm I'm literally going to buy you an Air and I'm going to send it to you and then I'm going to charge it to acquire. <laughs> Fair. Count me in. I've said it on air. You have my uh, <laughs> verbal signature. The air is really good. I bet. Okay. Uh, I I have a second one, though. Uh, we at PSL Ventures just invested in a great company called Starfish Space alongside our friends at uh, NFX and Mac Venture Capital. This company is so freaking cool. This is my first space investment from, from PSL. Oh, you've been wanting to do this forever. Totally. And this company is so cool. It's it's a, effectively an outer space tugboat. It's a tiny little satellite that you launch and it attaches to other satellites and can tweak them a little bit. It can just move them back into orbit gently. It can do things like extend the life of satellites by like five years. It can, uh, you know, decommission satellites that are in a dangerous place. I think we've all seen gravity. You don't want that to happen. You know, satellites should be where you want them to be. And it's it uses like it's autonomous. It uses electric propulsion. It uses this really cool novel technique to dock to other satellites. To um, that's a, a super versatile way to do it. And the founders are are just top notch. So I just wanted to like talk about them for anyone that's also a space nerd. Um, obviously, they're hiring, but. I think like just be go to starfishspace.com check out what this company is doing I just love the like incredible innovation unlocked by this birth of the um the the private space tech ecosystem these days so cool thank you SpaceX Elon yep man we gotta (laughs) we got listeners keep telling us not to do this because we get people's hopes up but uh I'll do it anyway We, we gotta do some more elon stuff we got to do like a tesla part two elon if you're listening we officially oh, you're accept invited y- yeah y- you're we'll have you for sure on the show <laughs> we'll accept your invitation to come on the show <laughs> and uh, if you're listening and you've emailed with elon like in the last couple of weeks like re- reply to that email with him and be like by the way i think you should do this yeah the next podcast you do it's got to be it's criminal that you haven't done it with us yet terrible nobody literally i'm not not even like being facetious here like nobody's going to tell the story better than us (laughs) i truly genuinely believe that so what are we waiting for on air rosenthal sales pitch (laughs) uh okay give Uh, me your carve outs (laughs) my uh my car this is a funny one it's like sort of embarrassing but I'm, i'm not embarrassed anymore um so for a long time, I saw all of my friends dropping like flies on this, not just with having babies that we're now <laughs> doing to last the party. Uh, I'm not talking about that, uh, but I resisted for years and I was like, you, know, you did this, Ben. And I was like, no way. That is just too on the nose millennial. I am not going to do this. It was my best pandemic purchase. 
totally. Uh, and sometimes the wisdom of the crowds is right for a reason. <laughs> I finally uh, became a card carrying millennial. I broke down. I bought a Peloton, uh, and uh, it's great. It's it's really great. Like, do you need one? No, actually, I used it for a couple months. I used just the app and a cheap spin bike from Amazon. It was fantastic. But I found I was using it so much, which like just shocked me. I didn't expect that. Like, it's so it's so efficient. You're looking in really good shape. Thank you, thank you. Well, and I was thinking, you know, I got the baby coming. Like, things are going to get wild. You know, I'm not going to have time to just like go for long leisurely runs anymore. I want to be <laughs> efficient, uh, or I'm going to turn into I'm going to start looking like my baby, all you know, flabby. Uh, and, uh, so yeah, then I broke down and I, I, uh, I used Ben's referral code. Thank you. Uh, got a Peloton, uh, pro tip. So I think this is different for everybody. Initially I was like, all right, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to go all in and get the bike plus. Um, so I got the bike plus initially and it's like really nice for sure, but it just wasn't, I had used a regular Peloton before and I was like, this is not, especially with the price drop on the regular Peloton, this is not a thousand dollars more nice. I can't believe it's a thousand dollar difference. I, it's, it's absurd. Like they need to, there's so many things wrong with Peloton's pricing strategy, but, um, like literally, you know, I don't say mean this to her, but I'm actually helping Peloton now. John Foley, if you're listening to this, come on the show. We'll talk about the pricing strategy. Yes. I actually mean it. We should do a Peloton episode. If you know John, if you're friends with him, tell him he should, should come join us. I, I love it. This is great. We're just episode <laughs> planning here. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, it's great. It's great. Don't get the bike plus. At least right now, it's stupid to spend $1,000 more. But the main bike, like, it's really freaking great. And now I get, like, amazing workouts in 20 to 40 minutes. Uh, and I'm just so glad to now have this heading into crazy parent life. Welcome to the party, pal. <laughs> uh, we'll have to check in. Uh, we'll do, you know, we'll have to do some, um, some like acquired group rides or something. Oh, that'd be fun. It'd be super fun. If you want to do that post in meetups in the acquired Slack. Great. All right. That's my car about. All right. Speaking of that, there's an acquired Slack. It's uh, got a great URL, acquired.fm slash Slack, nice and memorable. We uh, are launching a thing. I think maybe, depending on the order of these episodes as they come out, we will have told you about this on a previous episode. But if not, then we are announcing today, for the first time, or the second time, the existence of the Acquired Job Board. So, so many of you uh, have been posting in the jobs channel for years now in the Slack. You have hired each other. You have um, gotten new jobs through the acquired community. And it like warms our heart to see it because it's really cool to watch so many of you get to go work with each other. Levels, Solana Labs, Vouch, a bunch of different places that are, are, are sort of our friends and um, you know close to the show have, uh, have had folks join them. Uh, but now, if you go to acquire.fm slash jobs, that is in a nice organized format where you can uh, browse. And uh, there's even a little one-liner next to each job of it's kind of making their their Rosenthal sales pitch of why uh, this is a cool job and you should come work here. We curate them. So there's no one that's allowed to post there that we don't look at and approve and sort of decide um, personally that we think they're interesting opportunities. So uh, yeah, go check them out, acquire.fm slash jobs. Most of you know about the LP program, but I do want to highlight a recent episode that was friggin' awesome. We haven't shipped it yet as of recording this, but I bet it'll be out by the time we drop it. Uh, it is with Roniel Rumberg, the founder and CEO of Audius. So fun. I don't think I've had a better Web3 conversation on or off the show than with Roniel. I thought what was so cool about it was like, <laughs> we ranged from talking about like super technical, like, deep stuff like Roniel is a computer science like major at Stanford like we were actually there at the same time I was at GSP he was an undergrad so then we were talking about fun like just like tech history stuff from that era and then like towards the end we're like oh yeah by the way you're in the music industry so tell us a little bit about like you know that <laughs> and he's like oh yeah um oh like hanging out with dead mouse and yeah, like, Deadmau5, and like <laughs> yeah he's really cool he's a cool dude like like what what <laughs> yeah for people who don't know audius is crazy it, it has six million users and it's a, a crypto application like it's i think that brave and metamask are probably like the three largest um like applications by user count in all of crypto right now web3 yeah yeah 
He was like, oh, yeah, like Blau, Dead Mouse. Yeah, like they're, but like, they're really it, fun to hang out with. <laughs> and we got into like the stuff that I was really curious about, which is like how do how does a decentralized application work also with like a standard web stack, like a web two stack where you definitely need web servers and you definitely need to serve an application to people using regular browsers. So um, really fun. I'm actually going to go listen to it because I feel like I've forgotten some of the conversation and want to want to re-listen. But check that out. Acquire.fm slash LP. Thanks so much to our friends at Pilot, PitchBook, and NordVPN. If you want to share this with a friend, you totally, totally should. One-on-ones are our favorite. We like to grow with high affinity rather than uh, when a broadcast method. So um, pick a person that uh, you think would really enjoy this and please send it to them. And with that, listeners, we will see you next time. We'll see you next time. And next time... Well, next time you're going to hear from me because we, we did build up a little bit of a backlog. We'll actually be in the past. But then the <laughs> next time I talk to you, my life will have changed. So yeah, it'll be wild. Totally wild. All right, listeners. Later. We'll see you then. Who got the truth? Is it you? Is it you? Is it you? Who got